Howdy, rock stars. I've got a really cool announcement to tell you about. Now, it's super fun to listen to interviews with music producers, mixers, and mastering engineers here on Recording Studio Rockstars, right? It gets you psyched up to hit the studio and teaches you all sorts of new ways to make your records sound amazing. But wouldn't it be awesome to actually look over the shoulder of a professional producer while they mix and master a track in real time? And wouldn't it be more awesome if they explained the moves they were making at each and every step along the way? And wouldn't it be even more awesome if it was totally free and you could do it from the comfort of your own home or studio? The answer to that, Rockstars, is yes, it would be awesome. And that's why you're going to love this surprise I've got for you that will help you get killer mix and feel great about your mixes. Mastering.com is offering a totally free three-day mixing event called Fix the Mix, and you are invited. This will involve taking a mix that's loaded with some of the most common issues and fixing them in real time, explaining each step in detail along the way, taught by a panel of professional music producers, mixers, and mastering engineers. It's totally free, and the recordings of this event will be sent to all of you who register. So pause the podcast for a moment right now, scroll down, and click on the link mastering.com slash rockstars in the show notes to register now so you don't miss this upcoming free event. And then come right back here and enjoy this episode. Okay, now back to our program. This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Isotope, Atom Audio, Native Instruments, Lewitt, Spectra 1964, and OWC. You're hearing my voice right now on the Lewitt Pure Tube microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100D Mic Pre and C610 comp limiter mixed with Isotope RX Ozone, Neutron, and Nectar, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. Please check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes. It's a great way for you to help support this show. Now, Get ready to rock. It's inevitable that object-based audio that can track movement of your heads, either real or imagined, is going to be where we're going. I think it was a little unfortunate that once that hit, everyone's like, let's scramble to get as much content as possible into this format. And then, of course, what happens when you're like, we have 100,000 songs that we need Atmos on yesterday. Lowest common denominator and everything gets spit out. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. My studio is proudly powered by OWC, and I love how it's improved my workflow. OWC can connect all your audio work drives, trackballs, mix controllers, MIDI keyboards, audio interfaces, displays, or cameras so that you can work fast and focus on making your best record ever. Go look at the Mini Stack STX, Thunder Bay 4, or Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars to find the perfect solution for your studio from OWC. And thanks for using our custom link in the show notes. Psst, howdy rock stars. I've got a secret to tell you about how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars. My secret is using Isotope, RX, Ozone, Neutron, and Nectar to make this podcast sound great. Right now, you're hearing RX Breath Control, D-Click, D-Clip, D-S, D-Plosive, Voice D-Noise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, and Limiting all from Isotope. Go to isotope.com and use the secret code ROCK10 to get 10% off. Howdy, rock stars! It's your host, Lidge Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to Ooh. learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. <laughs> My guest today 
Joining us once again is F. Reed Shippen, a multi-Grammy award-winning mixer, engineer, and record producer whose credits include 10 Grammy award-winning albums, over 100 number one singles, and has worked with artists such as Ingrid Michaelson, Kenny Chesney, India R.E., Cage the Elephant, Little Big Town, C.C. Winans, Steven Tyler, Colony House, Lucy Silvis, Jesse Reyes, and Dirks Bentley. He's previously served as co-chair of the Producers and Engineers Wing of Neris and currently serves as the Chief Creative Officer for the Music Production House, The Music Playground. As an advocate for music education, Reed teaches a class at Middle Tennessee State University, where we were classmates together in Mm -hmm. audio school some 30 years ago. And as a co-founder of Song Farm, a creative-centered charity that focuses on providing creative curricula for secondary schools. He currently works out of his private Robot Lemon studio, Robot Robot Lemon, Lemon. located in Green Hills area of Nashville. Reed has been a guest on the podcast a few times already to talk about recording and mixing, so please go back and check those episodes. They'll be in the music playlist that we include in the show notes also. And today we're going to dig more into some mixing tips, maybe even talk about mixing in Atmos. Yes. And see what's new with Reed over at Robot Lemon. So please welcome back F. Reed Shippen, recording studio rock stars. Reed, my man, or should I say F? You can call me F. You ready to rock? <laughs> you and dude. few people. I am ready to rock, man. Thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure. It's good. To, it's good to have you back, man. It's always nice to see you, man. You, you just, uh, you look like uh, you, you exude like Old. a positive. <laughs> no, no, no. You just got like you just got this sort of jovial, creative energy. You know, I'll take that. I'll take that. Which I think, especially is cool, on a man. Monday, especially on a Monday. <laughs> Um, and I've said this before. I remember when we were in school, if I was to describe you, I would say, um, you know, like, uh, I think I called you F back then, but Reed oh. was, um, you know, always very self-sure, self-assured, you know. Oh, that's a really nice way of saying I was kind of a dickhead. <laughs> no, or even cocky, you know, <laughs> like you just seemed really confident about music and what you were doing there in school and what you wanted to do with it. And I always thought that was cool. And I just got along with you great. Which is, yeah. I mean, I yeah, we we did get along great. I I uh, I don't know where that cockiness came from. You know, I was scared to death, and I had jumped out of, you know, what my parents said I should be doing into something that I was interested in, but didn't have a lot of experience in. So, what was you know, the thing? Was I forgot scary. what your parents were. Well, you know, I mean, you like, I, like like any parents, and we're both parents. Like, you want your kids to do well, but you you carry in perceptions that come from you know, your parents, right? So my parents were like, look, you go to college, you get a degree, you get a job, you know, there you go. And I was in, I started as an electrical engineering major. That's right. Um, for a minute and some business, uh, like accounting. And then I, I just, I realized this sucks. I'm going to be bored. Um, I'd rather be interested and poor, right? So I jumped ship for recording. That's did why you, I Did you carry any of the accounting stuff with you? A little bit. I mean, just enough to somewhere actually back in my brain, track. there's like double double entry accounting in there somewhere. Like yeah. I can I can read a PL and a, a balance sheet, right? Which, by the way, is a skill that literally everybody listening to this should work on. Don't you just right? go to the bottom where it says how much money you actually Yeah, that's made? most people do. Most people do. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's uh, knowing how you got from gross to net is important. Um, and we, we've talked about, we talk about this in our class too. It's like, you know, if you're doing what we do, you were saying earlier, you're, you're a startup, right? You're self-employed. Right. Yeah. So you kind of have to know all of this stuff. So the, it's nice to have that knowledge. The last real job I had was delivering a pizza. Yeah. The last real job I had was working at, oh, you want to date me? Uh, Blockbuster. Blockbuster, sweet. Yes. I think I worked at Blockbuster here while I was going to MTSU. Did that? Um, do you remember that giving you an appreciation for sound for picture at all? Just no, it gave me ways. appreciation for the the horror of retail, yeah. um, and uh, but and definitely some customer service stuff. That Blockbuster, I know that it was probably the one that was right next to Vanderbilt, wasn't it? It was. Uh, it was actually off Nolensville Road. Um, kind of near Bell Road. Um, I lived in a house over there with a couple of other engineers and I was commuting to MTSU and like working in studios. Um, oh, you mean j- still during school? Still during school. Yeah. 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 So for you young rock stars listening to the show, Blockbuster, we used to have to go to a store to select what movie we wanted to, to watch that movies. evening. Yeah. And, you know, maybe if you were really hardcore about it, you'd rent a few, but you'd rent the VCR and it was always like, you know, and then had a little 
things printed on it said, um, be kind, rewind. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Which applies to... to analog tape as well, or be kind, roll out. <laughs> yeah, be kind, roll out. Tails out, man. Well, yeah. you know what's funny? Blockbuster actually illustrates uh, a point that we're probably going to talk about, which is um, uh, pivot or perish, right? Like, like be uh, be aware of where the future is and move, you know, skate to where the puck is going because Netflix came out and they were mailing DVDs. And yes. um, uh, Blockbuster was like, nah, we've got this great business model. We're crushing it. We don't have to worry about that. And then Netflix ate their lunch with streaming and Blockbuster went away. Um, and we see that over and over again in literally every field, but especially in audio. And there's a lot going on right now yeah. in audio that uh, yeah. that applies directly to that. So if you're going to be moving into this as a career, like come in eyes wide open with where things are going to be in three years, because it's going to look a lot different a couple of years from now than it does right now. And what's fascinating too is to really zoom out and you zoom out a little more and then you, you know, you see a story of Netflix where it seems like they dominate for a while and then they, and then it becomes, you know, all these other companies join the party doing the same thing and then Netflix struggles and then they're trying to, sure. you know, hold on to their, to their market share or whatever. What are some of the things that you see in the audio world that, that remind you of that now? Well, what you just said about Netflix kind of illustrates a general point about the way our system works, which is the middle gets crushed, right? And we've seen that um, uh, with the democratization of recording. Um, and, you know, back back when you and I were in school, if you wanted to record a record, you had to go to a studio that cost a couple million dollars and you had to work with people who had very specialized knowledge and it was expensive and time-consuming, so it wasn't really available. But those people had jobs where they had value. Um, now you can do all of that on a laptop in your bedroom, right? Not everybody can. Um, but a lot of people can. And so the people in the middle got crushed. Like they're not recording stuff in nice big studios anymore. Nice big yeah. studios aren't making a lot of money. So the people who were flexible about their skill set or flexible about what kind of content that they were producing in their rooms were the people who survived. So you've got the bedroom warriors who are totally awesome. Honestly, that's where the most exciting music's being made. And you've got the pros and the middle has been just destroyed. Yeah. Um, and that's what you saw. That's what you were talking about with Netflix. That's what we see over and over in music. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, even just listening to your discography um, and flipping through the stuff, you know, there's there's clearly a distinction, and I think this is true of anybody now, of you have the voice and then you have the music behind the voice that accompanies it. And then, you know, you start listening to records and you're like, okay, this is one where there's a band behind the voice and it's real instruments that need a real space to record in. And then this is a track over here that maybe has, you know, hints at the sound of a band, but they're probably samples that are recreated, you know, completely in a computer. Well, and that's, that's now. So in a couple of years, what you're going to be able to do is you're going to say, hey, I want to do a rock song. Uh, I want it to be 92 beats per minute. And I want drums that are reminiscent of this Foo Fighters song and this Led Zeppelin song, but I want them to be played by Aaron Sterling on uh, with this kind of sound. And generative AI will give you that drum track in about 10 <laughs> seconds. Um, and Somewhere it'll there. it'll sound like a really well-recorded, really well-mixed drum track. I mean, it'll give you, it's going to be able to give you the whole track. So what happens is, um, certain players, uh, certain specialists are going to become less necessary. But the people who are going to become more necessary are what I call design thinkers who can sit here and say, okay, I hear this thing in my head and I'm going to like make it happen. Those people we know now as artists and producers and they can go into a studio and you assemble the right people and you get the right sounds and you get the right arrangements and all of that. In, you know, in the future, in the year 2000, <laughs> um, you're going to be able to interface with an AI, probably just talking and be able to curate and compose and conduct all of that stuff iteratively um, in in a way that's like at at both ends of the scale. It's 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 really exciting and it's yeah. really scary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you bring up a really fascinating point. So the tradition of the producer as a great um, assembler of ideas and people and, and you know, um, all the players on something 
that's been around for a long time. Yeah. And you're describing this futuristic version, which is that same, potentially the same kind of mindset, but just new tools, you know, digital, digital versions of people. Yeah. So who do you turn to? Who needs to be a great vibe in the studio, like chat GPT? <laughs> <laughs> you know, eventually, eventually, sure. Um, at the At the base of it, music is still communication, right? So um, there's going to be the people who are ultra creative, who don't have the tolerance for um, screwing around with stuff. They generally need help of someone who uh, can bridge the gap between effective and creative, and they do have the tolerance for screwing around stuff. So mm-hmm. we've seen that over and over in the music business. I don't see any reason you why mean that like the very, the highly talented musician working with the highly talented engineer. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's so many uh, there's so many examples of that. The the quintessential one is Quincy and Michael, right? Like. Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson, why would Quincy Jones be working with Michael Jackson? I mean, he was doing like jazz shit and whatever, but that combination happened to be just like a really perfect combination. Hmm. Um, So who knows? In the future, Quincy Jones might be AI. In fact, in the future, you might be able to make a record with Quincy Jones's AI. Um, (laughs) Bizarre. My guess is because he's smart, you will actually see a Quincy Jones AI and you will pay for the privilege of using that. Interesting. So I can get a track to sound like a 70s um, theme song. 100%. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that me too. To me. It's going to be it's going to be awesome. It's going to be it's going to be really interesting. And yeah. actually I just misspoke there. You won't actually pay for it. You'll just use it and the revenues that are co- collected all over the world as your music gets used and reused and broken up in pieces and those pieces get turned into new music will all be tracked digitally. Right. And the money will flow to the rights holders directly. Yeah. Which, now you're talking. Which is super, super scary for things like PROs and record labels and such. So that that's an interesting topic that hasn't come up on the podcast in a while. I remember there was um it's sort of some of those discussions parallel, you know, the markets for things like cryptocurrencies and NFTs, because some of that technology is similar. Um, so I remember in 2017, somebody was talking about a, um, I forgot what it was called, but there was a name for it. It was like a, a music coin thing that was going to be connected to, sure. um, to music and creations and, and, uh, not, not to go continue in that direction so much as to say that the idea that the future could hold, um, digital markers in stuff that we create so that when you just, you could just create. And as it gets reused, it's tracked without you having to think about it yep. in such a way that, that the, the dots and the lines are connected. Like imagine, it's almost like a scenario where you're hanging out with your friends and they invite you into their session and you play a tambourine track on it and then you forget about it for five or 10 years and then that song gets reused in 50 different movies and all of a sudden you've got some income because that you played on this tambourine yep, track. You absolutely. Know? And you didn't have to really worry about it too much. It's intriguing. Well, I, you know, and it's not the future. It exists. I, I, I consult with a company called PEX. They have a uh, PEX. They have a um, technology that they're using. And they've also uh, just started uh, something called ARMY, uh, Rights Management Exchange, rme.com. And they're dedicated to tracking um, user-generated content usages all over the internet. Because guess what? People are using music all the time and they're not paying for it. In fact, I don't know if you saw, there was a news story a couple days ago about how Twitter doesn't want to pay licensing agreements uh, mm. for music, right? Of course, because it's a it's a bottom line expense. And, you know, these companies are publicly traded companies. They don't want to, they don't want to pay. No, well, even they if they're not public. They always want to pay the least. Yeah, they, the they don't want to pay money out. But guess what? Um you know, that's intellectual property. So they owe money. So there's a really interesting dynamic going on. I'm, I can't, I don't want to name the names, but they put in two songs that I had worked on, sadly, that I don't have points on, right? Mm. But uh, just these two songs who are, uh, they were both country. So they're niche. They're not like huge. They found $764,000 in unpaid royalties Wow! on these two songs. So think about how much money there is out there that yeah. people just don't know about because yeah. the, the things the the agencies that are supposed to be reporting this they deliberately don't right right so uh and they can't it's part of their business model they've there are actual 
heads of large companies who are supposed to be doing this. And one of them actually told a friend of mine uh, that our business model doesn't support paying everything that we owe. So, I can imagine. I mean, it's to begin with, it's a, a massive challenge just trying to track things sort of through people. Well, it's a massive challenge trying to track things through an Excel spreadsheet yeah. or a FileMaker Pro database. But it's not a massive challenge when you have something that can just look at the internet and tell you how many uses that you got in the last hour. It's also sometimes a massive challenge to do a podcast when Doobie's barking next door. So, Rockstars, let us know if you hear it. Yeah, no. You so know what's far, funny? We used to do <sighs> we used to do records uh, in Jay Joyce's house out oh, in yeah. West Nashville, right? And um, his dog made appearances on nearly every record. Wow. Right? So. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I've talked about this a little before, but I remember Roger Mutino once told me, he was like, he, he built a studio right next to a train, and he said, the train is so loud and it's right there, but for some reason, a train has never actually interrupted a record. Like, it's never made it onto a record in a way that disrupted the music. Something right. about it was too musical or something like that. Well, you know, it's funny. So we're building a studio. You're building it in a downtown area, and it's only going to get more. It's not downtown Nashville, but it's close enough. It's over by the soccer stadium, and it's only going to get more busy, right. right? So there's a subset of people who came from the old school, like, super high-end engineering crowd, like Bill Schnee. Like, he yeah. had one of the best studios in the world in L.A. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they spent all this money, and it was, like, amazing. You don't need that anymore. Right? What happens if a train goes by? I remember we went to Real World Studios, Peter Gabriel's place in the UK, and Brit Rail goes like right by the back of the damn property. And we were like, well, what happens if a train goes by to your recording? And they looked at us like we were stupid. And they were just like, well, you just cut it again. You know, like, it's like, all right, cool. Yeah, you just use uh, Isotope RX. Right. You take out, yeah, you use Isotope <laughs> and just magic out. that stuff out of there. Which, yeah. by the way, can we just talk for 10 seconds about how insanely good? their stuff is definitely let's like, do it i love it it's 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 like magic it's one of those things that uh like rx for example is one of those things that when i get into it i think shit i should go take like a advanced class on this because this is there's such a deep level of stuff that's that can be done that i'm not even doing yet uh, you, you know, know what you could probably just grab john baldwin from Infrasonic and say, hey, can I pay you for a couple hours of your time and you can show me? Because he is the RX Yoda. Yeah. Like he can do anything in that program. I feel like I'm like just one hand tied behind my back, just a bumbling idiot when I use it. But man, the stuff that he can do is miraculous. So John mastered um, a band called The Twigs for me. Um, and it was one of my favorite records I got to work on. And at one point, I was asking him about like, oh, what if we do a remix? Can we just insert it back into the mastering chain with this vocal up or whatever? And he pointed out that he goes through the track in RX and puts some time into it before it even goes into the mastering yeah. chain. And that was the first time I was sort of introduced to that idea. And, and um, so I can see how his level of knowledge there is pretty advanced. Oh, it's at this insane. Point. It's insane. I uh, uh, actually just had a really rough... A uh, nylon guitar intro on a track that the the artist is Chesney was like, man, I, there's just like there's noises on this thing, and I was like, yeah, like it's a nylon guitar with a guy playing it, and there's nothing else, right, nowhere yeah, to hide. Yeah, and I was like, uh, why don't you let me work on it? And I just sent it to John, and he sent it back, um, and it was just flawless. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I uh, I had a similar thing where it was just a, um, uh, a female vocal and acoustic guitar. She played the guitar and then she sang over it. And the guitar was very quiet, sort of played with fingers, no picks. And, and then I really had to kind of, I kind of really excited it a lot in the mix by the time I was done. And then I was like, oh man, there's a lot of noises and other things going on. And it was just fun to like dig into RX and, and try and tone that stuff down a little bit, but I don't have John's expertise. No, so he's I got, just, I mean, yeah. you know, what's funny is, is, uh, and I love that, you know, him, uh, Pete and I were just talking on the way over here and, and, uh, and I'm going to semi quote Pete and hopefully he won't get angry at me, but he's like, Pete man, Lyman. yeah, Pete Lyman. And he just said, man, I got to tell you, I think John Baldwin is maybe one of the best mastering engineers on earth. Nice. He's like, every time I hear work that he does, I'm like, 
Oh, fuck you, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how I felt about this record. Um, I mean, I just, I, you know, I didn't think about it comparatively to other records so much as I just felt like I was just so happy with it. Yeah. He, the low end, um, I had cut it to analog and it's an indie rock band. And, you know, we did some bald vocals where it was like an SM7 and you jack the input to the 1176 yeah. all the way up, mm-hmm. you know, and then you have to go clean out and everything in between. But it just had this great sound and, and, he did it in such a way that it just made me want to crank the car stereo. Oh, dude. Yeah. He said, you know, they say that they say that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I would say that about Isotopes plugins. And I'd also say that about John Baldwin. Yeah. Adam Audio can provide all your monitor needs, whether you're setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class full-size studio for professional mixing and mastering in stereo or immersive sound. Featuring the XART tweeter and custom DSP onboard processing, the A-Series monitors will perfectly adapt to your studio. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for you with an extended five-year warranty at atomaudio.com. Hey, rock stars, have you checked out Native Instruments recently? Look, no matter what style of music you make, Native Instruments gives your studio everything you need, from drums, loops, and beats, to the coolest synths, realistic strings, guitar amps, and futuristic synth pads. I personally love recording and tracking real bands in my studio, but then also adding awesome overdubs from Battery, Contact, Massive X, Super 8, Guitar Rig, and Hybrid Keys, for example. Go pick up Complete Start for free today with a bundle of 2,000 sounds and 6 gigs of samples over at nativeinstruments.com and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off. Some restrictions apply. What's some bizarre stuff that you've seen removed from a track? Oh! Sorry. Got it. My my temporary panels in the podcast just fell on the guest's head. Oh, that's stars. Right. So, um, but uh, we're, we're, we're actually, I, let me preface this. So we are now in my hopefully soon to be dedicated podcast right. studio, which is up in the house, which is closer to the dock through the window. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to have one place where I could just be set up and we just go and there's nothing else to to set up or do. I think you're going to end up in that ISO booth just because it's it's perfect for it. Do you think so? Yeah, Maybe I we'll think do so. it. I'll do one in there. It's, um, it's tight quarters. It is tight quarters, but that's okay. This is, you know, let's get intimate. Yeah. What, uh, what was that question again? Um, so RX, I mean, oh. I've, I've done stuff like removed, um, I actually removed, and I say this on the on the isotope ad that I have on the podcast, but I've removed shuffling papers and feet from a, a choir. Yeah. Standing, you know, sitting on, or um, standing on a bleachers singing a part. Well, I, you know, I'm kind of a troglodyte with it, honestly, but, you know, it's it's doing classical stuff. When you've got, I've done a, I've done a ton of stuff with like, you know, it's the London Symphony Orchestra at Abbey Road. So there's 86 players and they play a note into darkness and you hear people breathing and shuffling yeah, and moving yeah. and chairs creaking and bows clacking and yeah. you can get rid of all of that. We do we do a very limited version of what Baldwin does um, for vocals on mixing. My assistant will actually go through and just clean garbage stuff out of vocals like lip smacks and you know, I mean, we've, we, I remember having something, I forget who it was. It maybe, it might have been Shiflet's record or somebody, the, uh, they cut, they had cut vocals on a bus, right? Um, and you could hear like a truck go by or you could hear like the generator or something like that. And you can just go in with eyes of Bus 31, just, 32. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bus, bus one and two. <laughs> bus one and two. The back bus. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's pretty fun. So, so, uh, let me see what else. I recently, I was also going in and trying to explore DSing there, where I was like, you know what, I'm going to go in and instead of using the automatic DSer, I'm going to go manually like DS each S. Can't do it in a podcast uh, that's two hours, but I could do it in a pop song that's three minutes. Three man, you know minutes. what? 
Bless your heart. That, that's yeah. that's a lot of work. And I was in the mastering stage at this point. So gotcha. I was like, gotcha. I was like, this is the finishing touch. That I can see. I you know what? I will I want to call out another manufacturer and then throw them under the bus a little bit. Um there's a company called Synchro Arts, right? Yeah. And they have software called Vocaline. Um, that's been around for a really long time and is indispensable for getting background vocals to line up with lead vocals. And I'm sure they use it all over film and TV stuff to line up dialogue and all of that. Hmm. It has a really, it has a standalone kind of like RX, right? It has a really, really cool function where it'll identify the S's, right? They turn white and then you can go in and just decrease them. Yeah. Um, and it's super, super or cool. Or delete all the background S's. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's super, super cool, but the the UI UX implementation is so complicated that, um, you know, again, cavemen like me, I'm like, all right, I'm not learning this. Like, it just takes too long. Um, and of course, I think they're Germans. So they're like, I don't see what the problem is. You just like <laughs> press and hold option, hold L, they, scroll over to this, hit F3, like move this and that. And I was like, no, yeah, no, 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 no. They share an office with Melodyne, I'm sure. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> they laugh about it over lunch. But I was telling them, I was like, guys, if I could import a vocal and it highlights all the S's and I can just grab them and like move them down and then listen, like this is a hugely useful tool. Um, and as far as I know, they haven't simplified it. I, I haven't, I haven't looked back, but, uh, um, Hey, you know what? That kind of stuff brings up, brings to mind the, the topic you started with, with Netflix. Um, companies make changes fast when everybody else joins the party and everybody else offers the same thing. Um, and you know, so you see that kind of stuff everywhere, I think. I mean, sure. you know, it's like, it's funny though, because then you've got like topics people love to talk about you know, features being added to Pro Tools, for example, you know, and that's a company where features might get added. I, it just depends, you know, like a lot of, a new thing will come along and I'll be excited about it, but then somebody else in, in a comment is like, oh, so-and-so had that last year or something like sure. that. But, but then at the same time, then, you know, you realize that um, somebody like Pro Tools is very careful and cautious about making changes because there's a lot of people, there's a like the industry might sort of like crumble if they <laughs> if they broke it, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean you got to be careful. That's that's like big ass ponderous code, uh, and um, you know it's like when you fix one thing, you break another thing, and it's always just it's always just a process. Yeah, um, I feel like over the years there have been certain versions of Pro Tools that feel really steady to me, and other ones that is a little bit scary. Um, but I mean that's just the, you know who you need to get on. You get Andy Hong on to talk about. Pro Tools, because he, um, you know, he, he'll he tell you, he was back in the Sound Tools, Pro Tools Day coding for DigiDesign, and he'll tell you uh, that, like, one of the reasons why it sounded so bad is because he didn't know what he's doing, and he was just kind of faking it. So That's it's funny. a really, he's he's really, it's a really great story. You should talk to him And about now that. I know Andy through Tape Op. Tape right? Op, yeah. yes. Everybody knows Andy through Tape Op. They generally didn't know his work with DigiDesign. They don't know a lot about some of his other tech stuff. Um, and then uh, most everybody else knows him through some really, really kick-ass indie records. Like he did this one, specifically this one karate record that was amazing. Just like everybody freaking loves it. Uh, so definitely worth a listen. Like he's, uh, he has made, uh, he has put in a lot of time recording uh, punk bands um, yeah. just because he loves it. In fact, that's what got kicked him out of it. Uh, he got kicked out of MIT the first time because he'd rather be recording punk bands than uh, than going to school, which is a really fun sentence to say if you unpack yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I love it. I love it. There, you know, it's funny because you you started out in electrical engineering. I minored in it at MTSU. Right. And I was really fascinated by it. Um, but I didn't pursue it in in depth, you know. So it's like I've always had this real fascination for the engineering side of things. Yeah. But, you know, if you're going to be great at electrical engineering, you spend all day Locked in a small like dark electrons. room with no one around. Yeah, man, like building stuff, you know. <laughs> kind of like working in the studio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I ended up in the studio. So, you know, I learned hit things like quick keys for Pro Tools yeah. and how to move fast with a trackball. And then, are you using a trackball? Oh, yeah, I can't. I don't know how anyone uses Do you still love it? Yeah. You do? Yeah. I, I can't. I can't deal with... Still the, still the, um, the Kensington, Kensington yeah. Pro Mouse or whatever? Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's funny. As I get older, 
I find my my hand and my wrist is less tolerant of it. I'm rock stars. I'm doing this like really wimpy wrist move right <laughs> now to demonstrate. But it's like I feel like my hand kind of freezes up on it sometimes. It's well, weird. I think it depends on how you sit. And you know, and this is funny because because like everyone under the age of thirty or twenty five is rolling their eyes. But it's like when you when you get a couple decades into like sitting in a chair, like the chair you sit in really matters. Yeah. Like getting up and walking around and being cognizant that really matters because it's just not healthy to be sitting on your ass. And, you know, you and I, especially early, you end up sitting on your ass for 16 hours a day. Yeah, especially at yeah. the beginning. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, that I mean, the angle of attack on your trackball makes a huge difference. Yeah, I remember learning that early on. It's like you, when you're young, you've got all this energy. Like you're willing to, you'll, you'll dive in. You'll, you're not afraid to beat yourself up to get the job done. But then you quickly learn after like, you know, seven day weeks, uh, you know, like you said, 16 hours a day yeah. that if you're, if your keyboard is just a little too high or a little too low, or you have to look up or down at the screen too much, you start getting these pains in your neck and everything like that, that would just kill you. Yeah. One of the things that I did that made a huge difference to me is I, um, when I rearranged my studio and took the SSL out, um, finally the, um, I set my screen down on the floor so that when I sit, your natural angle that your head declines to is about 15 degrees. So my natural angle looks directly at a screen in front of me. And it is so much better than craning your head up and looking above something. Yeah, I recently redid my studio um, when I worked with Carl to, to put his Phantom Focus system in. And we put in an Argosy desk. And the whole reason, well, a big part of the reason why I removed my historic MCI console and swapped it out with nothing more than a desk for, you know, a tabletop for controllers yep. is because with the MCI, the meter bridge went up so far, which meant I had to move the screen up that far on the wall to see it. Yep. And, you know, when you, when you aren't working long hours, you look at it, you're like, oh, that should be fine. That's whatever, you know, people can see it in the back of the room. I can see it. It's fine. And then you do some work on it. You realize that just that tilting your head up too much will just, it causes your neck and your shoulders to just go into so much pain. I, I remember I'd do like a couple of days of editing or something like that. And I needed to go to the chiropractor or something. I, mean, I probably didn't, but I probably <laughs> needed to, you know? <laughs> so you make a good point. And this is an important one for you to remember, Rockstars, when you're setting up your studio, is be really, really serious. Um, unless you're not going to spend a lot of time clicking on the computer. If you're not going to, don't worry about it. Just put it wherever. If sure. you're just turning and hitting a record button and then the rest of it is looking at your bandmates while you play guitar, then it doesn't matter so much. But if you're actually going to work on it, you got to be pretty serious about it. It's worth even Googling ergonomic stuff like architectural design elements and seeing like, okay, what's the angle that my screen should be at? Where should my eyes be looking you know, should my elbows be 90 degrees or yeah. up or down a little? All it that sounds stuff super geeky, different. but, you know, I mean, guys that got into this hardcore were guys like Steve Jobs, and I think he took it to the extreme, but, you know, his whole approach and an approach that bears out with, with research is that you know, people kind of seem to have a certain amount of willpower. Like, think of it as a stack of wooden nickels, right, that you have, and, and everything you do burns a little bit of it. So I don't want to, I don't want to burn any physical or emotional willpower craning my neck to look at a screen. <clears throat> you know, I want to not think about that. I want stuff to be easy and fluid so that I don't have to break the right brain creativity to think yeah. about left brain stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's talk about your new studio setup. So you took the console out. Let me cross off all those. Are you using your SSL? Yeah. Mixer questions. No more SSL. Um, but you put this screen down on the ground, um, but you have a tabletop in front of you of some sort, right? I do, although that's, you know, that's also changing. I don't think I'm ever going to get to the, I'm going to put a laptop on my lap. I mean, a, a keyboard on my lap sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to try and get it to the point where uh, it's the stuff that I need right in front of me and um, probably also turn it to a standing desk. So occasionally I can just like stand up when I'm doing yeah. editing or non-critical stuff or whatever. Do you think you'll get a standing desk that's sort of like you just press the button and it yeah. motorizes? Yeah, I already it? have one. I've just been dragging my feet on like designing the tabletop and then having somebody cut me the tabletop where everything kind of sets in it correctly. Right, right. I was at Ikea recently and, and I tried out some of their standing desks and I was like, 
I was impressed with how easy it was to go up and down. That was very cool. Yeah. Um, what I wasn't as impressed with is they tend to use a two leg design mm. rather than four legs. You know, a four legged table like this one is really solid. It's very solid. It's not going anywhere. It's not moving. Although you might have just heard me shake the mic, rock stars. <laughs> um, but the uh, but with the two leg, it seemed a little bit teeny bit wobblier, and I was like, I thought it would just drive me nuts. You know, I'm spacing the brand. I found I found one that's like super solid. You did, um, yeah. and you know I can probably dig it up for you. It's it seems to kind of be the the cream of the crop thing. So my quick and easy version was I just bought an $80 standing desk on Amazon years ago, and I just rolled it up to the console, and I was like, screw it, I'm just going to move the keyboard up to this, so my speakers are too low. The truth is, you know, a lot of the decisions I have to make, I don't need to listen critically yeah. in the studio during the day. Um, I guess if you're mixing, if you're mastering, you're probably really screwed. <laughs> but if you're mixing, <laughs> you're probably more screwed than if you're producing and you know in production particularly there's just a lot of stuff you're doing that it's just like you know you make a quick decision about the sound of something and now you spend your en energies you know editing or moving things around and yeah you know you, you could be standing up so half of the time i spend monitoring i spend with a pair of speakers that are off to my extreme left yeah um you know i use those a lot so theoretically it doesn't matter whether i'm sitting or standing my head is not in between those speakers and that's on purpose What's the pair of speakers you like to use over there? Those are old Rogers, BBC, LS35As. Okay, cool. And are they big speakers or mm -hmm. are they just like little guys? No, nope, they're, like... uh, they're tiny. They're smaller than a shoebox. Okay. And then you do a pair. Um, are they spaced out like a stereo yep. pair or are they um, just like a No, nope, they're just spaced out thing? like a, they're a pair of bookshelf speakers spaced out like a pair of bookshelf speakers. What's the reason for doing something like that? It's twofold. One is I really like the way the speakers sound. Um, and I can listen at a low volume and get a real idea of everything low to high end. But the other one is is um, fully concentrating all the time is bad. Like I purposefully distract myself when I'm working. I concentrate and I can I can lock in like pretty hardcore. In fact, I just pissed off somebody uh, because I missed an alert to go to a meeting. And I realized that it was I was working. I was in this song. My phone alerted me like four times. My watch alerts me. I didn't even feel it. Like I, I was in it, right? But hyper-focusing on stuff like that leads you down a rabbit hole and you kind of disappear up your own ass when you're mixing sometimes. So I like to throw it around to different speakers. Um, I, will, I will pull up something on Wikipedia and start the song at the top and be reading Wikipedia. And, and what happens is the things that are wrong immediately jump out like to me. Like you hear something out of the corner of your ear and you're like, oh, I got to look at that. Um, whereas if you're concentrating and you get used to everything, like you overthink it. Yeah. Or at least I do. Who was it? There was a, a famous jazz, um, I'm blanking on his name right now, Rockstar, you'll probably think of it, but the jazz producer who recorded so many classic albums in his house studio. And the word was that the band would play and he would just read the newspaper. And when something was right or wrong, and if he looked up from his newspaper, that was that was nice. the trigger. Was it Rudy Van Gelder? Yeah, it was Rudy Van Gelder. Yeah, yeah thank you. And um, and I loved that idea. And it reminds me of all the times when I'm driving in the car when I just feel like I have this clarity for creativity, great ideas. You know, I can immediately tell if I like or don't like something. But I'm also stuck because I'm like, how the hell do I take a note about this right now and actually do something about it? You know, otter.ai. Tell us about otter.ai. It's just an online program that you talk into and then it turns it into text. Um, I use it all the time. I use it in meetings. Um, I use it when I hit a, a spate of creative thinking and I just want to grab it. Um, and then you have to have the discipline to actually go back and read it. But I was just using it today to put together a, a, a business letter and I had a conversation with a, with a guy I'm working with and recorded an otter so I could go through and just read the text and play back stuff and, and you know, and I had it. So it's really important to have a methodology where you capture creativity when you get in that mode. Yeah, for me, um, and so one of the tools that I use a lot now is, is called Samply.app and it's a great, um, it's a great cloud drive for music where you can upload projects into a folder, you can put mm. different versions of a mix as stacked 
and then they all play back um, in sync and level match. So you can also compare mix mixes back to back pretty oh, that's easily. Cool. And then you can, it has a commenting feature, which is great. But the challenge, of course, with the phone is if I'm listening on a phone in the car, you can't um, you can't sort of do the voice to text on the same phone that's also playing the audio. Right. So I'm always thinking about how like the real the real smart move is to have a spare old phone and just keep that in the car and just use it for voice notes so i can listen back at my main phone yeah or you should hit the uh, you should hit the dev on sampley um it's more often than not it's like one person and just say hey this thing would work really really well devs love to hear stuff like that yeah you these guys think, are great they yeah. they are a small team and i talk to them a bunch yeah there you go they love all the ideas but i i uh, i can I can empathize. I would hate to be in their shoes and have to keep coding all these things that I'm suggesting. Uh, you know what? Time. I think they love it. And if it if it results in a better user experience, like it's a great thing. I use a, a podcast thing called Snipped. And um, I like it because you're listening to a podcast and working out or whatever. And when you hear something that you really want to grab, you just tap a button or your headphone or whatever. And it grabs, you know, 20 seconds before and 20 seconds after, bookmarks it, turns it into text, and puts it in a in a way you can grab it. So oh, if they implemented great. something like that, you could just hit a button and it would just pause the audio and let you make a little note and throw a marker in and then just keep going. That All right. Rockstars, look for that one. I, I'm going to go download it to yeah. Snipped and then start using it on Recording Studio Rockstars. <laughs> Snip that text. Snip, Snip that text. Yep. Rockstars, and then go to our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups or something like that, slash recording studio rockstars, and go post your favorite clips in there. Definitely. Go, go post a clip of this. Okay. Of Reed talking. Not you, Reed. You can post your own clip yeah, if you, you want. Can, yeah, I'll, I'll post something. All right. Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound kind of weak or distant or lack punch and clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding much closer to professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins in Pro Tools, and the best part is that these mixing techniques work for you in any DAW, whether you're on Logic, Cubase, Studio One, Reaper, anything you can think of. If you're ready now to make your best record ever, then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. So um, let's jump in and talk a little bit more about your studio. Now, you asked me when we were down and taking a look at mine, I'm using um, a pair of the UF8 fader packs yeah, from the SSL, SSL stuff. Mm -hmm. and the UC1, and I love it, and it's great. I'm still, I still like to say I'm in the learning stage where I'm trying to figure out what kind of workflow I want to do, but maybe we never exit that stage. I don't know. Maybe we're always there. Yeah. Um, have you thought about ways to, you know, if you don't have your analog SSL in front of you, I'm sure you didn't get rid of things that make great sound for you. So you've you've substituted that with some other way to get the sound you were getting. Yeah, I mean prior. it was an iterative. I mean mostly the things that make great sound are great musicians, right? Yeah. Like and and great writers. Um uh yeah, I mean I it was an iterative process, right? I, over many years just trying this and trying that and tweaking this and comparing that and then just gradually narrowing it down where over, you know, the last couple of years I had the console, I was only using, I was using the mix bus and some parallels and I was using it for a couple of, couple of different things. Snares. Yeah, snares. Being able to turn, the, you, there's a great video that I, um, I tagged and we might throw it in the show notes, but you talked about like diming the EQs oh, yeah. on the highs. Yeah. There's the nothing sounds the like that on an SSL. Like yeah. it's, it's totally awesome. So now, the, and that's one of the things that really distinguishes physical stuff from, from using plugins sometimes, right? Sometimes. I, I mean, I think everybody gets an idea in their head about something and it carries forward um, for a long time. Like th things, DAWs, plugins, stuff that you encountered probably even 10 years ago that you didn't like. You still don't like it, but it, it could be amazing now, right? So I've had that kind of stuff happen. Yeah. Guitars, mics. Right. I put it away and then you try it later and you're like, wait a minute, what the hell was right. I thinking? Totally, this thing sounds totally. amazing. So, and, and a lot of us, you know, you read a lot of stuff and you, you get all in your head about it. But I mean, the basic, the underlying 
first principle here is if it sounds good, it is good. Yeah. Um, so like there's so many amazing tools you can get the right sound out of just about anything. Sometimes it's easier, right? It's really fun to pound something through an SSL. It has a certain sound. I'm used to that sound. Yeah. It takes a lot longer. It took me a lot longer to get close to that on certain things in the box, right? Um, but I know how to do it because at the end of the day, the sound is me. It's not the tools. It's it's the it's the person using the tools. Yeah. It's the musicians filtered through. Yeah. At Freed Shippen. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hopefully so, not too, so too what harsh. about the plug-in world? So like, let's talk a little bit. Of, let's talk about SSL for just a moment. Have you found the plugins that they're making to be a helpful substitute for the console? Are you finding SSL plugins from other manufacturers to be very useful too? Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like everybody and their brother put out a plugin of the of the SSL. Um, you know, all all of it is very similar. Let's be honest, right? Like all digital EQ is exactly the same, right? Uh, the plugin manufacturers will be bummed to hear me say that, but it's absolutely true. Digital EQ is digital EQ, right? It's numbers. Now, when you put saturation in there and you put distortion and you put all kinds of cool colors and flavors, like that definitely makes a difference. And people have made strides uh, making that stuff happen. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I I really love... Uh, one of my theories is why people love consoles is because there's an inherent chaos to it. Like there is no such thing as two channels on a console that sound the same. Right. And when you run something stereo through it, there is no setting EQs the same. There's no setting compressors the same. So that contributes to like width. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, Plugin Alliance did a really great job of putting like that random thing in there where you can like introduce some randomness into the channels. Um, which I love. Like I think that's that with their great. their channel strip console emulators. All, all their stuff has has I forget what. Sorry guys, I forget what it's called, but it's this thing where you can just kind of randomize yeah. the channels. Yeah, like um, crosstalk and things like that. Too. Yeah, stuff like that. And I don't know if it randomizes the EQ points, but it should. Um. Uh. So there's a lot of great plugins. Um. The SSL plugins nail it. Right. Yeah, they yeah. they sound great. I love them. I, I'm the channel strip two. And the new 4000B. Yeah. Both really impressive sounding to me. And I, I have the UC1, which is the controller for those plugins. And like your experience on the real console, I'm finding I'm much more likely to just boldly turn knobs on there. And that's that's fun for me. That, yeah. I, I'm way faster and more creative grabbing those knobs and dialing in a sound. Things I feel like I absolutely have to have, I have to be able to grab the EQ boost and cut, and, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe I'll do two hands. Maybe I'll do a, a Q or a frequency at the same time. Usually it's the the boost or the cut. And I have to have a hand on a fader because I'm compensating for what I'm doing at the same time. Those totally. are things that I find like kind of go together. I still love riding things on a fader. Uh, I just, it's more of a feel thing. I do think that when you can shut your brain off, yeah. And just feel and move. It's become a sculptor. Yeah. And uh, and also, I think we all have visual prejudice. So when you're looking at doing something on an EQ and it's like, whoa, that curve looks really big. Like you're starting to second guess what your ears are hearing. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a great thing. Yeah. Um, so as long as you can uh, find a way around that, whether you just ignore what your brain is telling you or whether you turn knobs instead of... Uh, you know, using a mouse, whatever works for you is is a good idea. Yeah, there's so many times where you instinctively mess with the sound and you you create something and then you go back later and you're like, oh, wait, this that, that's not right. I mean, I really need to do this low cut and I need to uh, approach the kick and the snare differently and, and then I go remix it or the bass, it's too much bass and then I go change the bass and I listen to the mix again. I'm like, but this mix sucks compared to the other one, you know? <laughs> you just go back to where you were. Richard Dodd told me a story a long time ago, and I probably said it on this podcast, um, but he was working on a band. And he was doing it mostly in the box because they were foreign, and he knew they were going to need changes. But there was this one song that it was just not working, right? Just not working, not working. He wasn't happy with it. They weren't happy with it. And finally, he was like, screw it. I've got a console right here. I'm just going to put it through the console. And he's like, I mixed it in like an hour, and it was killer, right? And everybody loved it. And then he said, well, they're probably going to change it, uh, so I should take pictures. So he got out a digital camera just to take pictures of the console in case he had to go back to it. And he realized after looking at the pictures, he's like, man, 
the stuff I did that worked for this song was so extreme that if I had done it in the box, I would have told myself, you know, you can't put 15 dB of high end into something in the box. That's just, that's just crazy. But when he was just listening and not thinking about it, that's what ended up happening. Yeah. And that was instructive. Yeah. It's like, um, it's like playing an instrument. Um, I find a lot of times when I'm, do, so do you play as well? I forgot. forgot not that I admit to in Nashville. All right. <laughs> I kind of started on drums a little bit yeah. and I had always sung in like choir and theater and let's do some um, singing right now right? yeah yeah let's do it yeah my my voice is top notch rock star <laughs> um and i play keys enough to convince my grandmother that i know how to play piano but uh right, you know right. i'm not there are so many insane musicians in this town i am not claiming that even a little bit well i feel similarly but i'm unafraid to stick my ass out there and play some music because i just <laughs> love doing it but um one thing I notice is there's a there's a mindset where I'm thinking about the music and it comes out a certain way, and then there's another one where I just get lost in it and I'm yep. just creating, and stuff starts to happen that adds up and makes sense musically, but sort of doesn't quite make sense logically. Like like I'm playing. Like an amp's turned way up, but I'm hardly picking it. Yeah. Or an amp's turned way down, and I'm picking the shit out of it kind of thing. Or, you know, singing a background vocal, and I stick my belly out as far as it'll possibly go, and all of a sudden I can hit the note, and it sounds great. You know, <laughs> just just like all this, all this, all these weird things that happen in the studio, like you're describing, where when you quit thinking about it, you quit, you quit trying to engineer design what you're doing, and you just start performing. Yeah. It starts to sound good. You let your intuition go. Yeah. And that's one of the the downsides of working entirely in a DAW um, because you kind of get stuck. People get st stuck in templates. People get stuck on rough mixes. And sometimes it's fantastic because it's their vision and you're here to further the vision. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's really tough. Uh, you, you have someone who's really, really stuck on something that's just not great, but they've been listening to it for three months. And yeah. for them, it's correct. Yeah. Do you find yourself in their shoes ever? I mean, as a mixer, do you ever find yourself in their shoes when you send it to mastering, for example, where you're like, it's it come, something that you did, or maybe as a producer, something that you did is coming back different and you're having a trouble getting it? Uh, yeah, I actually love for it to come back different as long as it's better, right? Um like I, I love when something comes back better. I've sent records to to guys like Ted Jensen and Pete Lyman and Bob Ludwig, and they yeah. come back better. And you're just yeah. like, you know, Ted just it's it's like there was a rainstorm and now the sun's out and there's all this contrast and somebody cleaned the window and I'm looking at this amazing view. Like, how does he do that? Yeah. Um, uh, I love that. Uh, I try not to get. I try and always evaluate. Is it better? Um, you know, is it better for the music? Is it better for the artist? Yeah. Do you ever feel like you need to not comment on it right away and just sort of like listen to it for a while and see? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, um, they say comparison is the thief of joy. And like when you, when you, the first thing you do is pull up your mix and pull up their mix and like try and actually compare it. Um, I think that's a really dumb way to listen. The first thing you should do is just listen. If it yeah. feels great, then it's probably good. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because when, you know, it's that experience also when you have made a record. I remember early on, I'd realized sometimes I'd finish something and I didn't know what I really thought about it until about six months later when I'd forgotten all about it. And it's that difference between being in the mindset of I'm listening now and I'm, and I can make a change to this thing I'm listening to and I'm obligated to make a change versus listening and just saying it just is what I, it, it is. What do I think? Right. You know? Well, I mean, I, I'll go one further. I generally hate like literally everything I do and I can't listen to it until months <laughs> later. And then yeah. sometimes you hear something and you're like, oh, that sounds good. I, or sometimes like someone's like, man, I really love this thing. And you're like, really? You go back and listen to it and you're like, okay, that was, yeah, okay. That, that worked out pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so another thing that we mentioned in the intro, um, you're teaching out at MTSU. Tell us a little bit about that. And then I'm going to give a shout out because I had the pleasure of going out and interviewing our teacher, Dan Pfeiffer, Dan, recently, who's yes. now on the podcast. Oh, so shout that's out awesome. to you, Dan. Yeah. Shout out to Dan. Shout out to John Hill. Um, like those guys were amazing. I had such an amazing 
experience down there. I annoyed the shit out of them, but uh, you know, they hung with me. So that's testament to Dan Pfeiffer. I'm sure he was ready to kill me a couple of times. Um, you know, so we're actually, as of right now, it is, it is not active with MTSU. The pandemic kind of killed some stuff and, mm-hmm. and what the pandemic didn't kill us wholesale ignoring all of the rules finally pissed off enough people that like, uh, it was hard to get traction. Um, but that was the, the, the intent of, um, we called it a minor in reality. Uh, the intent of a minor in reality was to take kids who were in the music program mm-hmm. and be like, okay, like there's school and there's real life. We're going to teach real life. Nice. Right. Um, kind of like an, an intern, bringing the internship into this classroom. Or yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was trying to get them to realize that there is real stuff going on that you need to know. Like, for example, the first thing that we did for every class was we passed out a non-disclosure agreement, right? And we just said, okay, um, we're going to pass out this non-disclosure and here's why. Everything that we do, we're bringing in artists, we're bringing in heads of labels, we're bringing in these high-powered people. They're going to tell you stuff that you can't go and talk about, right? right? This is like insider ball, you right? You can't so, start a podcast and just start blabbing about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, the the president of Sony, right? Or, you know, Dirks isn't going to come in and and say real shit if they know that the kids are like tweeting it, right? So what'd you talk about, man? <laughs> we talked about all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but so we passed out the NDA and then we just said, you know, sign this and pass this to the front of the class. And they would all sign it and pass it up. And I would hold it up and be like, okay, rule lesson number one, never fucking sign a legal document that you haven't read and understood. If you don't understand a legal document, you take it to an attorney. You have no idea what you just signed. This is not a good thing in the music business. It screws people all the time. Yeah. Right. Stuff like that is what we ended up doing. We talked a lot about mindset. We talked a lot about brand. Um, We talked a lot about the fact that you're in the music business and it doesn't matter what you're doing. Congratulations. You're a startup. You need to know how to communicate. You need to know how to read a P&L and a balance sheet. You know, you need to understand brand strategy, um, all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It was super fun and super chaotic and... Um, I'm sure we pissed off a couple of people and it, you know, we've gotten feedback that, uh, some people hated it and some people thought it was the best class that they ever had. That's usually a good signal. That's a huge indicator, right? That's like, I'd rather have people love it or hate it than be like, yeah, it was fine. Yeah. I felt like my YouTube channel wasn't legit until I had a hater on there. Yeah. Until I started getting a thumbs down. Yeah. You got to have, you got to have the thumbs down. You got to have the thumbs down. That's not that I, not that I feel like my YouTube channel. You can go digging for a minor reality. It's on like all the major podcast platforms. And a lot of times it was just me doing an interview with some ninja about life and, you know, all of that. It was fun. What are some of the things you remember students communicating about stuff that they were trying to? they were struggling with or that they were excited about or, or, you know, trying to figure out. You know, a lot of things that resonated the most was mindset, right? Like, um, what do you love? What are you pursuing? Like, go pursue what you love. Don't spend time. Like, if it's not a hell yes, it's a fuck no. Yeah. Like, don't spend time on stuff that you don't love. Um, Learn the rules so you know how to break them. Uh, Recognize that everybody feels imposter syndrome right? Everybody gets their feelings hurt. Um, like, it's just part of it. Like, accept it and move on. I mean, I, I, I got my feelings hurt two days ago. Uh, we, uh, we did a song for this guy and, um, you know, it was, it was a uh, complex, shall we say, not necessarily, uh, an experienced artist. And, I thought we had it sounded pretty good. And he came back and he was like, no, this is too far off from the rough. I just want the rough and I want the vocal to sound better. Um, so when I'm done here today, we're going to go into the studio and give him exactly the rough with the vocal sounding a little bit better. I don't agree that that was the right call, um, but it's his art, right? So if that's what he wants, then I'm going to try and give him what he wants. Which is a challenge to us as creators too to embrace the idea that giving a client what they want is the right answer yeah. at times, you know? Well, I mean, it's like, I or always look at this, right it's a service business, right? Yeah. Like what I do, production, mixing, engineering, it's a service business. I, I, they're going to listen to it for the rest of their life. 
I'm going to listen to it for a day or right. a week, right. right? It's up to me to make sure that they're happy. Now they're, they're going to know that I don't agree with it. And it's funny, you know, you and I have both worked on stuff where you get, you send it out and you get this page of notes, right? And then at the end, they're like, you know, well, so what do you think? And you're like, you know what I thought, like you heard what I thought. Um, and it's really hard not to get your feelings hurt, right? Because I give a shit, like I actually care. Yeah. So when I pour a lot of time and energy into something and somebody doesn't like it, I get my feelings hurt. But then I remind myself, like, it's not my art, it's yeah. their art. Yeah. And the more you do that too, the better you get at letting go of it and just being like, you know what? Now, now here I am today and I can look back at my past and I can realize there are so many records I just almost, I felt like I was killing myself over and now they're just in the past and they're just done and then we've, I've done more since then. And yeah. you start to realize you're, you're a lot more capable of surviving those moments too, you know? Totally. And that's, I mean, and that's part of the mindset. And I still do this, man. Like when I nail stuff, and everyone's like, that's fantastic. Here's a little tweak or maybe turn the acoustic up in the first verse. I'm like, yeah, yeah, fine. That's great. When they're like, yeah, I don't like it. This is way off. I'm like, I suck. I'm never going to work again. You know, that's just, that's, I think that's just part of a creative temperament. And you have to learn how to identify that in yourself and laugh at it a little bit and yeah. then put your head down and keep going. Rock on. I am totally blown away with Isotope Ozone, rock stars. I've been mastering a lot of my records recently, and Ozone makes it so easy for me to get a fantastic sound. The mastering assistant will help you get started by measuring your track and suggesting all the settings you need to get a professionally targeted result based on the genre and EQ curve of your choice. You can even reference a specific song if you want using simple yet sophisticated modules like Clarity, Impact, Low End Focus, Stabilizer, Imager, Exciter, and Spectral Shaping, along with powerful dynamic EQ, compression, and limiting you simply adjust the settings to your own taste and it sounds incredible. And don't get me started on Master Rebalance, which literally lets you reach into the mix and manipulate the vocals, bass, and drums at the mastering stage. My bandmates are pretty demanding of my mixes, but now when I send off the masters for approval, I get comments back like, holy sh**, pristine, damn good mastering, crystal clear, dude, you're a wizard. Finally, I love my singing and the drum Drums and bass sound huge. Check out the newest Ozone RX and all the other great plugins at isotope.com and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off. OWC is your one-stop shop for flexible drive storage and connectivity solutions for your studio. The Mini Stack STX for your Mac Mini adds two additional drives over a universal SATA HDD SSD bay and an NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD, plus three additional Thunderbolt USB ports. The OWC Thunder Bay 4 chassis, built like a tank, gives you four hot swappable 2.5 inch RAID configurable drive bays, plus an extra Thunderbolt 3 jack for daisy chaining up to five devices. Or check out the OWC Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock with two RAID configurable drives and seven ports of connectivity, including a front side SD card reader, one gig ethernet, two USB 3.2 ports, a dedicated display port, and an additional backward compatible Thunderbolt port. Get your studio connected with the Mini Stack STX, Thunder Bay 4, and Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Use the custom link in our show notes because it's a great way for you to help support this podcast. So thanks, Rockstars. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the second half of the show, a.k.a. The jam session. My guest today is Efri Chip, and joining us here in the new futuristic podcast studio, recording yeah. studio, rock stars. <laughs> um, so, are you ready to jam? Jam. All right. So, let me see here. Let me jump in and talk to you about um, either records, or if we want to talk about your new studio a little more. You want to talk about that? Some you mentioned that it was nice to be here, where there's light coming in the windows while we're doing the interview. Yeah, when I built my existing studio, I went out of my way to put daylight in it because, like, I spent a lot of years in not daylight, and I yeah. find it really helpful. 
Yeah. So yeah, I love daylight. So how did you do that? Is it an actual new building or is it a um, existing space and just sort of like letting the windows? The thing that we're building right now is a, an actual new building. So what we did was we oriented a fair amount of, uh, of rooms towards a place where you could get some clear story windows in the, you know, in the rooms and get some daylight in. Some people hate it. I, I know some people who love just being in their cave and being in their vibe and like, and feels good. That's what night is for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I mean, there are, there are things that happen creatively when I'm, um, I'm not so sure about the mixing element of it. I tend to do most of that in the daytime, but the creative stuff, cool things can happen late at night. I just can only do it for like one or two nights and then I'm spent for yeah. a week. Everybody has their, I mean, you can dig into circadian rhythms or tradian rhythms. Everybody has the way their brains work. You, you know, you would do well to identify when you're most creative, when you're least creative, and then pattern your work habits around that if you can. Yeah. And I like breaking it up. Yeah. Every yeah. once in a while, I love to just do a power weekend where it's, you know, I'm going to bed at six in the morning. Dude. But that's, that's not very often. I do not function like that. <laughs> I function much better, strangely. I function... And I was never a morning person, so this is weird. But I function way better early than I do late. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's definitely things that my brain does a lot better. Uh, prepping for this podcast, for example, I, I'm, that's good for me as a morning thing, mm-hmm. being fresh. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk about these five letters, which have not made it into Wordle yet. A T M O S. Atmos. Is that part of your world now? It is. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's. I think it's part of everyone's world. There is raging debate on whether it's going to be around, whether it's not going to be around. Um, do you remember surround? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Um, I try and take a, a little bit of a different take on it. I really like mixing in Atmos. Okay. Cool. Um, it's really fun. Uh, I've always heard in my head things being like, wide and expansive and immersive, if I can use that word, right? I just want to feel like I'm in the music. And we had to do a lot of tricks with two speakers to try and make it sound like that. Um, Like put things out of phase. (laughs) Yeah, put things out of phase, run things through, you know, delays and spread them around and like everything that you can do to try and get two speakers to sound huge. Well, it's so much easier to do that in Atmos. Um, The issue with Atmos is it's a nascent music tech. It's been around for a long time in film. Mm -hmm. Things that work in film do not work in music and vice versa. And we're finding this out. And this technology has been adapted, you know, from film to work in music. So there's things that work. There's things that don't work. It's a huge learning curve, right? You're just kind of starting over. So it's scary. And it's kind of disruptive and it can be kind of annoying. Um, it takes you out of your comfort zone. It totally does, which is, I think, something that's really healthy. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of the delivery mechanisms are either non-existent or the specs are weird or they keep changing. Um, and it's really, really difficult to um, to deal with that. Um, plus, of course, everyone gets used to, well, this is how much it costs to make a record. And now... They're like, well, can you do all this extra stuff and we don't want to pay any extra money? And it's like, well, no, because it it's different. Like, and you also have to fight the whole, like, well, just make the Atmos mix sound like the stereo mix. Right. And it's like, well, that's kind of like just saying, well, just make an orange taste like an apple. They're two different things. They just are. They're yeah. inherently yeah. different. So you try and get close, but um, when you have a pre-existing stereo mix, but uh, it's really difficult because it's two, just two different things. But it's really fun. Like, I... I realized when I was mixing in Atmos and I had to go back to stereo, I was kind of like, oh, I miss the stuff I can do in Atmos. And that was kind of eye-opening for me. Yeah. Well, so I actually just got my first two songs on my record mixed in Atmos, Matt Boudreau. Um, oh, yeah, by Matt. the time this comes out, they will, they'll have been out already. But um, two songs, Chickadee and Meaty Stripe. Don't ask me about mm. the titles, especially since I'm vegan now. <laughs> but the um, but it's it was really quite an experience, and it, it involved things like what I was mentioning, like having a creation that I had just sort of completed, come back in a new way, a new with you know yeah a new outfit on kind of right, and and having to respond to that and and get excited about it and you know or give feedback or make changes or suggestions, and it's just fascinating. And and now my car, 
um, I have a Model 3 Tesla, and it has this sort of built-in kind of surround sound capability. I'm not sure if I trust it yet. Mm. I'm not sure if it's really playing an Atmos delivery back or if it's just kind of doing something to make everything sound a little bit wider. Right. Um, but that, you know, that speaks to what you're saying about the um, the delivery mechanism being a moving target still. Yeah. So what are some of your thoughts about where you think this stuff is headed, um, potentially headed? Uh, I know um, Chuck Ainley was on the podcast recently, too, and he seemed very excited about what's coming with it, you know, as if we're like a lot of the challenges are going to get sorted out, which we see all the time in technology. Yeah, know, I mean, any... Point. Any disruptive technology is a pain in the ass, right, when you first start using it. And then people sort stuff out. Um, I, I, uh, there's a part of me that wishes that parts of Atmos had been created for music instead of adapted from film to music. Right. Um, and that presents certain challenges. Um, you know, I'm especially not super enthused about the headphone implementation, right. um, which let's face it, most people are listening to this in headphones. Right, right. Um, you're, not in, you're not as enthused about the way it is now or the way it even could be? I mean, we could, I don't want to go down the theoretical rabbit hole, but uh, I think that the headphone implementation was kind of like, hey, we're, this is a tech for a theater, but we have to make it work for headphones. And it was very difficult. And... I don't know if it's uh, if it's great yet, and right. but that's okay because you know when when we first started using DAWs, a lot of people were like, "This sounds like butt," right? Like a, when CDs first came out, a lot of people were like, "This sounds like butt." It it needs it needs time to get better. Um, so and then "Live in La Vida Loca" comes out, and you're like, "This is the first track that was done entirely in Pro Tools." Uh, yeah, this is number one, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, it's uh, people don't dance to converters. Um, the uh, we all live in an inversive sound environment, right? Yeah, um, we're a generation and a half, maybe two generations into people who consume a fair majority, if if not an absolute majority, of their entertainment in immersive environments, and that's called video games. Right. Um, when you want suspension of disbelief for a human, well, this is where Atmos came from in the theater. Honestly, this is where surround came from. Um, it's really hard to feel like you're in the middle of an event if the sound is coming directly in front of you, right? Because our ears are used to 360 degrees. Right. So if you want suspension of disbelief in a virtual world um, that everyone is more and more going to be inhabiting, you need immersive audio. Um, you don't want to be playing a video game or inhabiting a virtual city or even just, you know, having a virtual conversation. Um, and then you put on some music and all of a sudden the music feels like it's like close in your eardrums where everything else feels like it's in a world that will right. immediately break you out of the illusion. Right. So it's inevitable that object-based audio that can track movement of your heads, either real or imagined, is going to be where we're going. Uh, so I think it's good that people are starting to get into it. Um, I think it was a little unfortunate that once that hit, everyone was like, let's scramble to get as much content as possible into this format. And then, of course, what happens when you're like, we have 100,000 songs that we need Atmos on yesterday. What happens? Lowest common denominator and everything gets spit out. Yeah. Well, that's um, what happened when CDs came out. Right. Everything just got re-released as CDs and they just didn't sound good for a while. Yeah. So instead of pointing fingers, what I'm going to say is, where it really gets interesting is I I did a mix, I did an Atmos mix a while ago for an artist and I played it back for him. And they were like, man, this is what music sounds like when I'm high, right? Which I took as a high compliment, no pun intended. And then they turned to me and they're like, well, wait, so does this mean that we can actually make our next record knowing it's going to be in all of these speakers? And I was like, yes. And yeah. that's where it's going to get really yeah. interesting. Yeah, I agree. I'm fascinated to see what people will do when they start thinking about them as, um, you know, voices to be used yeah. in music. Yeah, I mean, I want to see what, you know, I want to see what all kinds of fun and crazy stuff So, so this thing that we're that. recording on right now is my Sound Devices Mix Pre 10, which will do, um, well, it's got eight, you know, XLR inputs. It can record up to 10, but let's just say eight for a minute. So I could set up 
And and these mics, I definitely have aided these mic tech PM9 mics. So I could do a podcast interview with up to eight people in a circle. And I'm curious like what that would be like to start delivering podcasts in Atmos where you have sort of a surround experience. Somehow. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we uh, why don't we get the Infrasonic crew on here and do it? Like we'll actually do we'll it. We'll make the first yes. the first Atmos we'll podcast. We'll make the first Atmos podcast and we'll sit people around in a circle and you know, we can record, mix, and master it. We have the technology. I love it. Um, where can we, at the moment, where can we deliver that? We can l- deliver it on Apple s- Spatial. It'll play back. W- I don't know if it will on Spotify. Will Spotify play any Atmos? I don't back? think um, Spotify is delivering Atmos yet. Um, I don't think YouTube is delivering it yet. Right. Um, uh, Tidal, Amazon are delivering binaural Atmos. Apple. Amazon, my Amazon Music yep. Yep. collection. <laughs> yep. Uh, I mean, their streaming service, right? Yeah, right. Which has of course, a ton yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apple delivers spatial audio, which is not exactly Atmos. Okay. It's an interpretation of part of the process. Of course, Apple has its own thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other thing that's really exciting about Atmos, um, and this leads to the whole dis- disruption thing we were talking about. I mean, it's less exciting for me because I'm old and set in my ways and new stuff is scary. Um, but, you know, you can do Atmos with Logic and Logic costs 200 bucks. Right. Right. You can get it on your Mac and just you can go directly into Atmosing. Yeah, I haven't exper- explored that yet, but I've definitely heard about it and I'm fascinated by it. It's yeah. very cool. No, it's I mean, anything that anything that brings creativity, like a new thing for creativity, like I can't I, I, I sit here and I'm I'm like Daft Punk, it would be fascinating to hear what Daft Punk does when they, or LCD Sound System or yeah. somebody like that, when they're like, you know what, we're going to do a whole record specifically for Atmos. Look at you going straight for EDM yeah. in the land of country music. Well, EDM is, I mean, EDM is a is an expression of that. Like I can see uses for it there that's maybe better than for rock music or for country music yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I, I think it would be fascinating to do the whole kind of, you know, um, um, you know, vocal ensemble too. Yeah. Where you're surrounded by vocal, whether it's a cappella or whatever, you know. Yeah, or bluegrass with amazing players where you are you feel like you're sitting in, in the middle of a circle yeah. of incredible players playing. Yeah, well, so, so let's, let's, we'll dabble on that for a sec. So first question, where are you as a listener? If, and when I think about, a podcast with eight voices, I can picture sitting at a round table of people having a conversation and you're one of the seats at the table. And that might make sense to my brain, you know, sitting, uh, even a bluegrass ensemble, if you went to a festival and people were standing around, they'd be potentially standing around in a circle and you'd stand in that circle, sure. not, not in the center of the circle necessarily, but on the edge of it. Yeah. Do you think, do you picture um, a cool place to be, to be right in the middle or sort of well, As a member of the circle. It's a weird place to be because that's not something that you usually get to do. But the only reason why it's not something that you usually get to do is because we didn't necessarily have the technology to do it. Right. So again, the point of immersive is you would be able to sit outside the circle or you'd be able to walk into the middle of the circle or you would be able to walk around behind and and whatever. And you yeah. would be able to still have the illusion of people playing. All right. So... Um, you're now talking about and describing another cool aspect that I'm guessing you have some thoughts about, which is the um, VR aspect of what's possible with music and creation and listening back. Obviously, if you're in a video game and you're in a VR game, you have this ability to turn your head to the left, turn your head to the right, and the soundscape changes. Mm-hmm. Um, are you? Do you ever think about uh, you know, even hearing you describe not having a console in front of you, but having a desk and then thinking about changing it, I've thought a lot about how cool it would be, potentially. Um, it might also suck, but but how cool it would be to create in a space where I go into my control room and it's more of an, a blank slate of a physical space and I'm in a virtual reality space. Yep. Maybe the speakers are still maybe it's an atmos set of speakers that are that are installed but i can sort of move a little bit freely within that or maybe it's totally in headphone land you know or it's totally in something where i can turn my head in 
you know, as I'm creating, um, I'm making a long question out of this, but what, what thoughts have you had about where something like VR or augmented reality can intersect with either the music creation or the mixing mastering aspect of it? I'm excited about VR, MR, mixed reality, AR, augmented reality in general. Um, it's going to be a little bit, but I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be standing in a circle, um, you know, or virtual or real and using, you know, gestures or even voice commands to um, do what we do, right? It's kind of like Minority Report or right. like even better, it's, you know, you're going to sit there and actually talk it through. Yeah. You know, like, give me the drums. Okay, more cymbals. I, you know what? I don't want, I only want the crashes to be louder on the top of the choruses and stuff like that. It's going to be really weird because it's just a new way of doing things. But, you know, it's no weirder than doing things with a keyboard and a mouse. And that was no weirder than doing things with a console that had 80 inputs instead of four. Right. And all of that. So, you know, it's just a, it's just moving into the future. It's going to be kind of fun. No weirder than having eight microphones in a tube mixer rather than just one microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no um, weirder than my um, Victrola being able to wind up and play back sound through a right. horn, scraping a needle through a horn instead of actually having musicians in front of you. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so everybody talks. Everybody's going to talk about how it's this and how it's that and whatever. But you know, music has innovated over and over and over again, and I think you know it's still improving. Some people might argue not, but um, yeah, it's going to be interesting and exciting. What do songwriters, music producers, DJs, EDM, TV, and film composers all have in common? They all need incredibly cool sounds that instantly transport the music to the style that they want. This is why Native Instruments is your ultimate toolkit with a massive library of sounds. Whether you want to create hip-hop, indie pop, classic rock, meditation music, pumping dance floor beats, or full orchestral arrangements, Native Instruments Complete Bundle offers you everything you need from drums, loops, and beats to wild synths, ultra-realistic strings, and vintage electric bass, guitars, and keys. The list goes on and on. I personally love recording real bands in my studio and adding cool drum samples, synths, and futuristic keys from battery, contact, massive X, guitar rig, and hybrid keys, for example. Plus, it's super fun to create a string section for a rock band come on go get complete start for free today with a bundle of 2,000 sounds and six gigs of samples over at nativeinstruments.com and use the code rock 10 to get 10 percent off some restrictions apply adam audio introduces the all-new A-Series line of monitors, featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, built-in DSP-based room correction, and speaker voicings to allow you to customize your Atom Audio monitors to your control room. The A-Series will rock in any studio. Small studio spaces or immersive multi-speaker configurations are perfect for the A4V or the new A7V, the next generation of the incredibly popular A7X. Mid-size rooms and narrow spaces will love the low profile of the A44H, expanding on the A7V sound, or the A77H, a true three-way midfield monitor delivering rich, spacious, sound. And bigger studios will love the A8H, a three-way speaker and the pinnacle of the A-series that delivers extremely accurate sound required for critical listening environments. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for your studio with an extended five-year warranty at AdamAudio.com. Well, I also get interested in the physical health aspect of it, too. So when we started out, you know, we signed up for something that was this creative process where, yes, you sat in a chair and, yes, you sat at a console, but you moved about a lot. You know, you had to go over to the gear. You had to run out to the microphones. It was There was more stuff going on. And then it quickly turned into an industry where your elbows are at your sides all day and you're just clicking on a computer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, now, of course, you had a console going too, so you you know you kind of kept that that hybrid thing for a long time. Um, but I think that being able to create where you're standing up, you're sitting down, it doesn't matter. You're doing what you want to do. Maybe even the movements, as you described, like Minority Report, report you're moving your arms around all day long. Yeah. I just think that's potentially going to be healthier for us. Um, I'm sure we'll find signature. a way to make it unhealthy because that's just <laughs> what humans do. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I could see that it's a lot, it's a lot better for you to be standing up most of the day than sitting yeah. down. I definitely. mean, you were talking about a standing desk too. Just having that option, just being able to, you know, change the way you're doing it while you're working. Yeah. would be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, here's a question for you. Whether it's stereo or whether it's mixing in Atmos, what came first, the drums or the vocals? Mm. I mean, I think the vocal always comes first. It's impossible to separate stuff, right? But I think the vocal always comes first. I spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time experimenting in Atmos to make sure that the vocal came through in physical room, in binaural, in spatial, like all of that. Because that's what most people key on. Um, yeah. Actually, I think it's about 50-50. We just had this debate. I looked up some research. It's like half of the people who listen to music listen to the vocal and the words. Half of the people who listen to music listen to the feel of the track and listen to the words last or that's later. That's interesting. So you right? felt you sort of surveyed the people and this is what the people... I think there's actually been studies done, right? Yeah. You know, and I don't know how anecdotal they are or how rigorous, but I, I'm I'm definitely somebody who listens to the feel. Like, me too. bang me a track and a, like, if I'm feeling the track, I'll listen to it and I will come around to the lyrics eventually. We need to survey the mix community. Yes, and I think that would be an amazing a, online survey. Yep. It would be an amazing online survey for all the rock stars out there. It's like, you know... What do you connect with first on a song? And maybe yeah. not even mixing, just as a listener. I know for me, the question would be, at what point in the record-making process do you suddenly get the lyrics and the meaning of the song? And there's been so many times where it wasn't until the song was done. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, sh that shit, that's what this is about, man. That's pretty cool. Now, and, and, and it depends on the genre. Like, country is very much vocal forward, Right. And maybe even more so, I've noticed that people who are coming up through social media, TikTok stars, right, that start to make records, um, they're so used to hearing their music as like an acoustic vocal that when you actually make a record, um, they're like, turn the vocal up, turn the vocal up, turn the vocal up. And sometimes it gets hysterical. You feel like, okay, well, this is a vocal. And then like somebody's playing the music on a boombox in the next room. Like, it's weird, but they're used to hearing their yeah. vocal yeah. and just in a guitar, right? So I get it. Um Hip hop is all, is all about the wordplay, right? And but they the beat. love to bury the vocals. Yeah, and they love to bury the vocals. So you you know you gotta you know you gotta have the head knock thing, and then eventually you get around to the wordplay, and you really appreciate like how how deep it can go. I've struggled so many times to understand the lyrics in a hip hop song. I mean, I'm I'm a definitely a fan of hip hop and and love um, the feel and the beat and the rhythms that go with the with the lyrics. But there's many times where I'm like, I just, I'm going to have to listen to this 10 more times to start getting what's being said. You yeah. Know? And maybe that's partly the intent too. And sometimes I wonder if it's just that, you know, my my ear isn't as advanced as somebody who's living in that world all the time. Or right? it's just what you pay attention to versus what other people pay attention to. Yeah. You know. But it is fascinating to think whether there are people who are mixing and find themselves wanting to, you know, sit in the engineer role and manipulate the sound who are lyric focused first and, and thinking that way. I've, I, there's many times where I've gotten to the end. I'm like, man, if I was, you know, maybe I was producing it. Maybe I wasn't. I'm like, boy, I dodged a bullet on that one. If these lyrics just didn't make any sense and I was just finding <laughs> out now, that would have been, you know, I missed an opportunity to say something at the beginning of the record. That's hysterical. <laughs> well, in Nashville, we have, you know, a lot of things start with demos and yeah. The demos are like, they they have to sound like finished records because that's how you get a song cut. And you also have to know when you hear a song, you have to be able to hear the lyrics. So what people do is they kind of telephone the voice and super compress it and crank it up loud. Everybody listens. Everybody falls in love with the song like that. Then you go in and cut it. And then they listen to the record, right? And their gut 
is like, well, I've been listening to this song and I fell in love with this song. I've been listening to it for six months this way and now this is totally different. And like, I don't know, it doesn't feel as good and it doesn't feel as exciting. It's like, well, the the demo was distorted yeah. to make it exciting. The vocal was cranked because they want to make sure you can hear the lyric when you're considering the song. But it guided the way people made records. And that's natural. That's just a human thing. Yeah, we always call it demo-itis. Yeah, demo-itis. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's funny. I find myself doing the same thing. I'll, I'll record with my band in the studio and we'll, I'll do a quick rough mix. And my, the secret I've learned to do at the end of a long day of making music that was probably too loud all day anyway is put it on the Oratone speaker mm-hmm. as low as it'll go, put it in mono, and then just balance everything so that I can hear each instrument. Like I'm not making, like that, that my ear can do, even if I'm wiped out. Yeah. And, um, and then I'll live with that. And it's not the mix that I want ultimately, but it usually has 90% of the right energy for the song. And then I'll go back and do a mix mix. Well, and then I'm back like, to your oh, feel shit, thing. That's that? back to the feel thing, the yeah, intuition. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I've had I've had records where I turn into a mix and the producer's like, yeah, man, you know what? It's just the rough feels better. And I'm like, you know, fuck the rough. And he was like, it's your rough. <laughs> 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 and sometimes when you're not paying attention or you're under the gun or you're in the moment, you know, you just make better decisions than when you're overthinking it. So how do you, in those situations, how do you go back and reference a rough or a track and let it guide you? What are some, what are some of the mechanics for you? for referencing something in the mixing process. I always, like, I'm going to go mix a song today when we're done. And the first thing I will do is listen to the rough mix, right? That is the first thing I will do because I know that there's intent in it and I know that people have been listening to it. I also find that when I'm listening to the rough mix and I'm not thinking about anything else, right? I'm just listening to the song. I'm paying attention to the parts of the song that jump out. A lot of times, well, not a lot of times, you know, sometimes I'll hear like this really cool hook that was in the tag after the chorus and I'll be like, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to fly that to the intro, right? Just as an experiment. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that's what you get from listening at altitude. And then I will dive into the song when I have an idea of like what the song is, right? right? What the intent is. And then I'll start going in and trying, hopefully, to make things better. So... What about, again, some of the mechanics of it? If you're you're working in Pro Tools, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so uh, does a rough mix come to you and it's already got sort of a, a mix with plugins and automation in Pro Tools? It depends. Sometimes I get that, sometimes I don't. But we print, we print or request the rough mix and it goes on a track at the top of the session through a separate output so I can press a button and listen to the rough mix at any point and it's locked with the multi-tracks. So at your volume knob controller, you just hit a button and yep. it switches to that mix. Mm-hmm. And then you can just sort of level match it that way if you want to. Yeah, you can level match it. And then sometimes when you're in with the artist, they're like, man, there was a thing in the rough. Like, can we hear the rough real quick? And I can just go, bam. Yeah. And then hear, hear that part. Yep. Yeah, that's smart. All right, so now if you are going to pick up where a mix left off in Pro Tools, what are some smart lessons for how to do that easily or how to leave yourself, you know, breathing room without undoing what was already there? I I mean, I kind of have my own way of doing things, but we just leave sometimes when we get a session that has all that stuff, assuming all the plugins work. See, that's the other thing that everyone forgets is like there's a billion plugins and you can't be expected to own all of them. Right. And people don't commit stuff. It's also not very helpful to you as a creative and a mixer to have too many options. Yeah, I mean, it's, I I mean, I want to, in an ideal world, somebody who's doing a track in Pro Tools will select all of it and commit and say hide and make an active. And what I will get is their committed stuff. Mm-hmm. And underneath it is the actual track with whatever plugins and whatever, whatever. So you have to go, if you have to go down and dig for it, it's right there. Um, that would be great. But, you know, you try and preserve the original intent. Um, it, starting from scratch all of the time seems to me to be a fool's errand. Like there is no difference in my mind between, hey, we're going to cut acoustic on this and I'm going to deliberately put a 57 on the acoustic. I'm going to slam it through an 1176 and we're going to use a J50 and kind of get a beetle like kind of thing. And we're going to print that versus 
somebody cut an acoustic and as they were working on the song, they were like, I'm going to put compression on it and I'm going to put a little distortion on it. It becomes a part of the track. Mm -hmm. So print it, like commit, commit to it. It's, I love it way more when people are like, here's the stuff that we committed to versus, hey, I took everything off of this because I know you have better ways of doing it and all of that because then you're spending most of your time trying to get back to their intent. Yeah, you're like, they're like, yeah, I know that you were trying to have a life outside the studio, but I thought maybe it was better if you didn't. <laughs> so I've removed everything that we already did. So you got to spend all that time putting it back together again. Well, then the biggest problem when you really run into is people who are doing their tracks through like massive amounts of multi-band EQ and compression on the mix bus. And I'll get I'll get a track where that's not on it. It doesn't get sent. It doesn't get committed. And I'll listen to the rough mix and I'll listen to the multis and I'll be like, I didn't even get the right kick drum. Well, I did, but it had like 15 dB of limiting and it had like a huge boost at like 50 and like 120. And it makes the kick drum on the rough mix sound amazing. It makes other stuff sound bad. And then you're stuck in the, well, how do I get that sound on the kick drum? but not have it screw up the bass and this and the vocal and all of this other stuff. That's always a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I did that um, to Tom Lord Algae. Oh, really? Years ago. Yeah, we had a <laughs> song and I had done this very elaborate intro with panning and effects and all this stuff. And But they needed, he needed it. Um, our interpretation was we were asked to take it out of Pro Tools and put it onto a multi-track. And I was like, oh, how am I going to do that? So I unraveled everything I did, put it onto the multi-track. No. And I got it. And it was like, you know, it was it was a comical moment. There were many comical moments for young Lidge as he was learning how to do this stuff. Well, and that's, I mean, that's something important that we covered in a minor reality and that we should reiterate over and over and over again. Like, fail early, fail often. That's how yeah. you, you know, learn. Like, screwing up is how you learn. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. So let's, uh, well, let's, let's continue this question for one more second. So yep. the, which came first, the drums or the vocals, when you're mixing, um, what is the difference between, I guess you, you said it, I guess you said it depends on the project and depends on where you're at with it, but what are some, what about template wise? You want to say anything about stuff that's helpful so that you can quickly arrive at some vocal ideas. If you're going to start with the vocal, um, Things like parallel processing or whatever whatever helps vocal. Yeah, I mean, I, I use a lot of weird stuff, right? Like I have a lot of vocal parallels and that came from the thing that I used to do with a console and multiple compressors and just combining them to get uh, different flavors and kind of adding all those flavors together. So I have a vocal parallel um, that's tone. I have a vocal parallel that's spatials. I always have two effects sends. One is quote unquote verse effects, which are more subtle. And then one is a chorus effect, which might kick in a tiny bit of distortion and or like spread like harmonizer and like longer delays just for the chorus. So it gives you a bit of a scene change. And those are always there. Whether I end up using them or not really depends on the song. So they're all they're all mutable or unmutable things. So yeah, there's, there's, there's and sends and they're all there, like, right? Yeah. Like, so the, you know, the first thing, I'm really fortunate that I get to I get to have an, uh, uh, an engineer that helps me set stuff up. So a lot of times he'll set it up so that the send for the FX2, which is the chorus, it'll turn on in the choruses. Right. Right. And yeah. it's just, you know, there. Um, now, if you're not going to have a console in front of you, is this stuff, when you go to manipulate, is it going to be reached for the trackball? Or do you... Um, are you interested in having any, you know, fader controllers or things like that that let you control like a console, even though it's plugins and Pro Tools? Yeah, as of right now, I don't really have that. I mean, I've got an Avid dock. I use the fader. Mm -hmm. um, I've got an iPad on it, which is very useful, especially in like Atmos for panning and stuff like that. Yeah. But generally, I've gotten used to just manipulating with a trackball, although I am really curious about the SSL thing, and I'm curious about how it integrates with Pro Tools. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, I'm learning that there's two ways to think about it. You think about it in terms of layers. So if I have layer one, it's set up to interface with Pro Tools in Huey mode, mm -hmm. which is very limited as far as what's possible in Pro Tools. But it does mean that a fader move here equals a fader move on in Pro Tools. Right. It means that a solo button on the UF8 equals a solo in Pro Tools, a mute equals a mute there, or record enabling it um, enables automation 
for the Pro Tools fader. And then the next layer is the, um, uh, what do they call it? SSL plugin layer, I think they call it, which mm. I, I like to just refer to it as 360 layer, which means this layer just talks directly to the SSL plugins. So if you put the plugins last on the insert, for example, which for me makes some sense. Like I would probably process a sound and then it hit the console yeah. and then I'd mix it from yep. there. And so if I put it last, then it talks directly to the, to the SSL 360 app where you see all the SSL channels, which represent the EQ, the compression for the kick drum, for the snare drum, whatever. And those specifically represent, um, they're specifically talking to that plugin on that track then you, if you put the SSL on every single track, then you can hit solo on the SSL layer, and it actually talks inter talks you know whatever intercommunication between the other SSL plugins. Gotcha. So that it'll yep. solo the track you're on by muting the other ones as well. Yeah. So the last insert, basically the last insert on every track, gives you a console in between your mix bus and your multi tracks. Yeah, and so you can actually. There's different ways you can think about it. You could actually leave all the Pro Tools faders at zero and use the SSL faders and do your automation there inside the plugin. Mm. You could do both. You know, you could just use the just leave the output of the um, SSL plugins at zero and use the Pro Tools ones for fader moves or a combination. Think about them like a, you know, um, like level balances with the SSL faders, but then maybe you do um, trim balances on Pro Tools and then final automation moves there. Or something. I, I feel anxiety rising in my body as you say that because of the complexity and also because like out in your living room, I see an old Pro Tools system with Triple Eight. Yes, you noticed that. Yes. I'm and not, I haven't found a new home for that yet. I don't, I'm, I'm loath to just throw I, it away. I have suggestions. For, I can help All you right. with that. But, um, you know, like that sounds great until it really isn't, which is when uh, an artist is like, hey, do you remember that song we did three years ago? Like, we're going to throw that on this record. Can you pull that up? Right. And you pull it up and you're four versions of software away from that. And the and I'm not picking on SSL. This happens with everything. The SSL software is like, yeah, we don't do that anymore. And you're like, that was all my automation. Do you ever feel like the time that you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take you years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of our students, David, quote, absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process that I've ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along along the way, but condensed into a six to seven hour session, close quote. Look, I'm so confident that this will take your mixes to the next level, that if you can't get a killer mix within 30 days, I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So if you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and start now by checking out the free preview of the ultimate snare mixing trick. And I'll see you at the front row table of the Grammys. Cheers. Yeah, those are those are challenges with all of all the stuff you're doing. And um, you know, I don't know what the answers are yet. And and I don't know if I'm even describing it the right way. Um, but I, like I said, I'm I'm exploring it. But but I will tell you what I do love about it. It when I'm in that SSL layer, all the faders talk directly to the UC1, talk directly to the plugin. It's yeah. instantaneous. I can just grab, I can touch a fader and start turning an EQ knob, and it is EQing the fader that I'm thinking about. It's not accidentally EQing the bass over on this other channel, or I didn't just undo the vocal chain. Yeah. And to me, that's the key. It's like, I want to be, I want to move fast, and I want to make a decision without having to 
pause and think about whether I'm working on the right track. Yeah. That's always been the biggest challenge for every version of working with plugins and Pro Tools. Yeah. Is that classic, classic scenario where you turn the knob on a on a plug oh, in and you're dialing so it times. in and then you realize and you're like, oh, that sounds better. And then you're like, fuck, I just messed up the bass track. Dude, I do that in <laughs> Atmos all the time because like counterintuitively selecting the track doesn't necessarily select the panner, right? For the object. So oh, though, like, I'm like, all right, cool. Unnerving. I got this. And like, I'm twisting. It. I was like, man, I don't really hear much of a difference. And I realized like that thing that I just did that took me a while to figure out. Yes. I just totally jacked it because it's just, on another channel. destroyed camp. all yes. your work. Oh my gosh. That's, <laughs> I feel like such an idiot when I do that. So that, that is where I'm most excited about what's possible with it. And I, I sort of encourage SSL to think about it like, um, think about it like it's always been. So think about it like Pro Tools, when you use Pro Tools with a console, there's a certain element of where we think Pro Tools is a tape machine and the console is the mixing console. And so there's a part of me that thinks, just just to do it like that, like give us everything we need to do to mix in SSL again digitally and and we'll take any DAW and we'll just feed it like it was a tape machine. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it's, it's tough because... Um when you get set in your ways about something, it's hard to break away from it. To a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I'm not throwing the UI UX designers of Pro Tools or SSL or whoever under the bus, but, you know, SSL is concerned with making things work like an SSL. Right. Pro Tools is built on the assumption that you're going to do everything in Pro Tools. There's yeah. stuff that, and I can't tell you specifically right now, but there's stuff in Pro Tools where I'm like, well, this doesn't make any sense, but it only, it makes sense because... Pro Tools assumes you're just going to use Avid. And like, that you're you're doing posts for movies. Yeah, that too. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'm sure it's great for that, right? So uh, that's just a constant, it's, it's just going to be a constant problem. So it, what it really comes down to is, does it work for your workflow? Does it stay out of your way so you can be more creative and less, how do I do this thing? Yeah, so the, the good points is, um, you know, the reminder is with all these ways of working, I think the bottom line is, you're going to have to invest a little time into trying something out until you determine whether it works with your workflow. Yeah. You know, I think often we want it to be instantaneous, like, and effortless. But the truth is, at the point at which you would be frustrated by how it messes up your workflow, it's usually a reflection of the fact that you've been working that way long enough that you've already got a workflow. Sure. You know? Sure. Absolutely. And, and you know, and then y you do well to challenge yourself to force yourself to think outside of your cognitive bias, yeah. like to to force yourself into situations where you're like, well, maybe I can do this differently or let me, you know, let me try this. Like get cognitive dissonance into your process a little bit so then you can discover new ways of working. Yeah. As the Buddhist monks um, said in a book I was reading, le learn how to lean into the sharp points. <laughs> nice. You know? Yes. Just get comfortable with being Sharpie Q points. Watch yeah, your Sharpie Q points. <laughs> All right, um, Dirk Bentley, gold, yeah, um, has a great in-your-face quality um, that works great in country mixes as well. What are some of the things that have to happen to create that kind of sound? What does that even mean to you? Well, like, there's a, there's a, everything's kind of like there's an excitement to to all the sounds there. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, great players, great songs. A guy who knows how to sing his ass off, right? Like, you know. Working with these pros, uh, I mean, the level of musicianship is just stupid. It just yeah. is, right? So part of the challenge with recording all of that stuff is, you know, getting out of the way, getting some flavor. And, and you know what? I I screwed stuff up. There's stuff on that record. I cut Brian Sutton playing guitar and his, you know, Brian Sutton's like arguably one of the best acoustic guitar players on the planet. Uh, and his guitar probably cost a half a million dollars. And I pounded that fucker through an SM7 and like way over compressed it and didn't realize until in the mix, I was like, oh, I obliterated this acoustic. Like it's, <laughs> it's terrible. But creating that when you're recording and everyone's vibing on the way it sounds in the headphones, like people will make different creative decisions, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of part of the process to get everybody in a mindset. Um, you know, we kind of cut that thing a little more rock and roll. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was one of your PEM credits, right? Produced, yes, engineered, yes. And that was uh, that was fun to be able to participate in all the aspects of that record. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of it has to do with Dirks is just a great singer and a really great dude, and 
people on that project are all sitting there like being pro and everyone's trying to make it as good as humanly possible. And it's not about ego and it's not about he said, she said, and it's not about blame. It's about what can we do to make this great? So yeah. Hopefully well, it, it sounds like out. some of the um, in-your-faceness of things were decisions being made at the production stage too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Just by just like slamming things. And I just ways. like, I, you know, I like things that are a little more aggro, I guess. Um, so, you know, I just did it and let somebody else tell me it's too aggro or whatever. Right. Um, and maybe you can dial it back in mastering, guys. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Another record that we just did that was a lot of fun that was very similar is the new L King record and and oh cool yeah she's Tell a badass singer and that that we cut that record in a matter of days um, with a the, again a bunch of amazing players and L sings her ass off right so she can go into the vocal booth sing with the track run two or you know two more passes down after we've nailed the track and like you know the song's mostly done it's incredible um, so we're spoiled. So what's L. King's story as a as an artist, as a musician? She yeah. is um her dad is uh I'm just a comedian. Yes, she's a yeah. comedian. And she's she's uh she's an incredible singer. Um and an incredibly cool person. Like she's just vibe for days. Uh, and she came into my Bonnaroo studio at one point, um, and she was doing a cool rock and roll thing. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's just fantastic. I love her. And I, it was so much fun making that record. And, you know, at, at points, to be honest, when we were cutting it, I was, it felt like a sprint. And I was like, can we slow down a little bit? But that, that urgency got into it, right? That was actually one of the records where, um, you know, uh, uh, Ross and I, like, he would be like, dude, it's just the rough. It's just not feeling as good as the rough. And I'm like, screw the rough. And he's like, it's your rough, bro. Like, it's like, oh, crap. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, let's see. There was another ask uh, thing I was going to ask you about. Um, oh, I just see it here. Yeah, her dad. Uh, is it Rob Schneider? Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Eli Young, Saltwater Gospel. That was another one in your playlist. Yes. Um, you know, and I have, to, I have to update my playlist and my bio. And we'll my website, send a new one to you. and my Wikipedia, like it's it's woefully behind. We'll do. It. We'll let you update it. We've got a running playlist for oh, you. Oh man, I'm that's... I'm terrible at I'm terrible at that. I literally have to go to like all music and be like, what did I work on? And so, Rockstar is a reminder that we have a playlist of music in the show notes. So just scroll down and you can click on that and you can go listen to um, a bunch of the records that Reed has either produced, engineered, or mixed. Yep. And of course, if he gets to it before you do, there'll be more more stuff. I probably there. won't, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. There's plenty in there already. Um, so, Saltwater Gospel. Um, that one of the things. This is maybe an odd question, but that's got a particular melody that really goes up and down a lot in the verses. Mm. Um, and I love asking basic questions like this. Um, it's challenging sometimes, or is it challenging for you to keep the vocal up front on lower notes in a melody? Yep. And um, talk a little bit about that. Explain some of these basics to the rock stars of what we're talking about and um, ways to solve it. You know, is it things like clip gain and automation that are helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that uh, I'm working right now. Um, I've done a, a handful of records with Kenny Chesney and, uh, you know, he's pretty well known. And he's also got that low voice, right? Like he can get down to those notes. Sometimes, especially in a busier track, it's really hard to grab those. So... What I use constantly is, uh, is uh, what do you call it? Um, I mean, clip gain, but also like option six. It's the, the uh, oh, clip the, effects, uh, clip right? Effects, like the yeah. BEQ. So a lot of times, very recently, actually, on stuff that I've been working on, when he gets down low at the end of a phrase, um, I'm going to go in, break that into a separate clip, roll a little low end off, add a little high end, like make sure it articulates better when you get down in that range. Yeah. And I'll do that. I mean, I'll do that for, uh, I'll do that dozens of times in a song if it needs it, right? It's it's lazy to just be like, yeah, it'll be fine. Kenny knows exactly what he wants. He's very focused on his vocals. So we'll sit there and, you know, I, I, I just, I was just joking with him. Like someday I will ride a vocal when Chesney will come in and be like, no changes, it's perfect. That day I don't think will ever come. <laughs> we always ride every little thing 
And um, it's great because he cares and he's in there with me and he pays attention. Yeah. So I, how, when I have that low stuff, I, I definitely carve it so that it balances out. Yeah. How, how and when does that come into being useful in the process? Do you already have the basic tone of the vocal ready for the mix and now you're just making final adjustments? Or is it like before you even mix the vocal, you can just tell on, on kind of a raw vocal with just a, some compression on it? No, I I'm I, I get the vocal in the ballpark where I want it. Um, and then I build a track around it. I generally, you know, I will start with the drums after the vocal, right? Mm -hmm. I'll mute the vocal and I'll start with the drums and turn most of the instruments on and kind of fool around until the track feels... 75% there and then I turn on the vocal because I spent way too many years getting the track 100% there turning on the vocal and realized the track was actually 40% there because right. as soon as you turn the vocal on everything changes yes. right and you forgot to leave room for it and anyway um, so I'll get that and then I'll ride it right and it's just kind of layers of an onion like you go from altitude and you make it feel good and then you go down a level or two and you do overall rides and then you go down another level and you look for specifics and then you go down one more level and you look for like articulations and little ends of phrases and little things and just you know that's when i'll cut it in and actually use eq to bring stuff out yeah it's pretty fascinating clip i i found um myself discovering the clip gain and i even remember what it is like maybe shift control and arrow keys give you instant like up and down clip gain as well, well. i use the kensington trackball right so you can you can clip it, it right? and you hold it and you just rotate that ring and it goes up and down in yeah. like half db and it's it's so amazing if you can get into a flow that way boy you can just really go through and chop stuff up quickly and do you find it's helpful uh, as far as moving fast to just go ahead and chop clips and don't even worry about crossfades at first, just listen for levels. Then you can, cause you can always go back in and, and clean them back up again. I don't chop tons and tons of stuff in clip gain, right? Usually for me, that's an overall move. I don't, I don't care about crossfades. You can just set pro tools to automatically crossfade and that works 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, you have to be careful that there's not a pop or anything in right, it. But if right. there's a pop in it, John Baldwin will use RX to take it out. Um, Thank you, John. <laughs> and thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, I, you know, I use tricks also. Like, there's a really great Waves plugin called MV2 that, uh, you know, I don't know how many people use. And I was just using it the other day. I love it. Like, I, I use it to turn up low stuff a little bit and I put that on the vocal that's probably the first or second plug-in on a vocal and it just helps lift some of the stuff that's under a little yeah. bit so I have to do less going in and gaining things up because that'll just give it a little boost so you're using you're using the bottom up um slider not the top down so you're yeah. not using the limiter part of it I well? yeah I mean I'd have or to maybe. look but most of the time it's just the bottom up thing just to catch things that get softer and just kind of give them a little bit of a boost. What about Arvox? Does that still make it into your... If it sounds good. Your quiver right. of plugins? Yeah. I mean, I, we could... You look at any given record and it's a totally different thing. Yeah. Um, you know, there's all kinds of plugins and some of it people would look at it and be like, are you crazy? And some of it I go all crazy with all of my shit and then I listen to the rough and I was like, man, the vocal's better. So I turn all that off and just use... The producer's plugin, which is, you know, is going to be like, I don't know, an 1176 and C4 or whatever, you yeah. know, it doesn't matter. This podcast is proud to present Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I master my own records using nothing but plugins. Plus, I take you into a world-class mastering studio, Sterling Sound, to meet with Ryan Smith and hear how he professionally mastered my record, Skadoosh, for release to streaming platforms. That's the music you hear on this podcast, Rockstars. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free mixing course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free free plugins and Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even upload to your website if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy to get started now.
Well, it's fascinating because vocals are so key to a song and to a mix and a production. And because they're so human, um, most of the stuff we do, yeah. <laughs> until the AI starts singing for us. V synthesizer, there's it's, like it's singing now. It, well, it's it's just fascinating because it's like a vocal that seems completely too dark and shitty for one track might be the perfect thing for another track. And that one that's hyped up and got all the highs and all the breathiness and all the, you know, f fizz on it would just suck on the other one, you yeah. know? And it's like, you kind of have to determine what is that thing. I remember mixing for an artist and she didn't like that the vocals sounded. She she didn't like what I was doing. And then she showed me an example of something else. And I went, I was like, well, let me just try rolling off the top. And I just like killed all the high end. And all of a sudden she was like, oh, it's so much better. She yeah. loved it. Everybody, it's I mean, like, everybody's wow. different. And you also get people who are like, I want my vocal to sound like John Mayer, right? And I'm like, yeah, I do too, right? But it's not going to ever sound like John Mayer because you are not John Mayer, mm -hmm. right? And that's not EQ. Do you say that to John Mayer? Mm, I haven't I haven't met John Mayer <laughs> yet, but, you know. Um, I, I, and that's, I mean, I get what they're saying, but part of being a good mixer is learning how to interpret what an artist is saying because artists tend to be like, can you make it? more orange can you make it yeah. go up at the end yeah. like stuff like that that's how they interact with music learning how to translate that into stuff i mean kenny and i have been going back and forth on this last record and i'm really proud of how the vocals sound they sound awesome but i tried this and then he thought maybe that was like a little too bright so we dulled it out and then he came back and he's like ah, i may have overshot on that and we're just like kind of finding a level and it's every song is different because in different keys his voice sounds different, right? Um, on different days, his voice might sound different. And he's pretty damn consistent and they use the same recording chain and everything. But, you know, something that's a, you know, a major third away from the last song is not going to sound the same with the EQ. So it's just a, it's an iterative process. Yeah. Um, ben Rector, Let the Good Times Roll. It's it's a live band mix yeah. or it sounds, you know, it sounds like a real band in there. Um, do you find that more challenging than mixing with loops and programmed music? What are some thoughts about what it's like to mix real musicians playing versus, you know, things that are created out of samples? Uh, you know, no. I mean, it's 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 just different. I think, honestly, the thing that I find the most challenging is is what I call drums in a can, where someone's using superior drummer or something like that, and they want it to sound like live drums. They want it to sound like inferior drummer? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some amazing, there is some amazing programming. And in fact, I just did something like random, uh, well, not random. I do I do a project or two every year for Disney. Oh, um, nice. And the producer on that, this guy named Mark Hammond, was like an A-level session drummer for like 20 years. And I actually have to ask him, I was like, did you program that snare fill? Because it is flawless. And he's like, yeah. I was like, that's just unbelievable. Like I, I, you know, he's amazing at it, right? Um, but finding, getting like the the drums in a can to sound like glue is very, very difficult. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is because some of these sample libraries are built to sound great on their own. Yeah, because people are auditioning that one kick right. and that one snare. Right, but drums don't sound great. They, they don't sound finished on their own. So getting that to integrate is always tough for me. And I'm always looking for the glue with the overheads in the room. In my opinion, a drum kit is one instrument, not like 20 instruments. So trying to get it to feel like a drum kit with a guy playing it can be really challenging. But I love I love using live stuff. Like I, I love live band stuff. Do you have some good tricks for making them sound like they make sense? I mean, because I've definitely got drum questions that I didn't ask. But I mean, like, for example, when you have canned drums, do you sometimes, you know, reamp them in an actual physical room? And is that part of a secret? Or? I've tried everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it just, you just, the trick is to keep going until it's good. Right. Right. And not to get frustrated and give up. Um, so I don't really have a physical space in my mix room now to do that. But we've actually, I have actually gone to Ocean Way on a record and reamp the drums into the Ocean Way room and re-recorded it um, to try and to get a sound. Or You're like, I'm not waiting for the plugin. Yeah, or you use layers of parallel compression, or you use the Ocean Way plugin, or um, the T-Verb plugin, or 
just try stacking. I've stacked multiple room plugins together and then you you pretend that it's a room and you slam it through a limiter, you put some distortion on it and you blend that back in and you just you keep trying until you get something that Have you works. had a chance to try the the new Fame Studios? Yes, it's awesome. Plugin? I love it. I've been oh, using great. the hell out of it. Like it's it's just it just sounds great. It like, has a it has like a legit quality to it that just sounds like uh, there's something sort of thumpy and awesome about it. It's too. great. I just used it. I specifically just use, I use the plates a lot and the chambers, um, but I just use it on a, on a record that, that was kind of played in a room, but I wanted something to tie into the room. So I use the studio a room preset or whatever. Yeah. Um, Hopefully I'm going to be down there shortly. Oh, that's super cool. You know what? If you do that, you got to go stop by Craig Alvin's place. Like he just put together his own studio. Planning on it. Yeah. You should I mean, you should record while you're down there. He's got like a UA610 and Spectrasonics and all this cool shit. It looks amazing. Like yeah. it's going to be such a cool place to record. I'm so ha happy for him. Craig's a funny cat because he's like, he's one of these guys who will always have a story like, oh, I just found this, you know, universal audio mixer in a thrift store somewhere. Or something. Yeah. I, I don't think this one was that. No, but. he's the king of that. He's the king of that because he's from Portland, Oregon. So he would always like stumble across these super awesome finds, yeah. right? Yeah. He's yeah. he's a ninja at that stuff. Um, all right. So um, we're, we're, we're just about done here. So. All right. You good? Yep. All right, cool. So um, should we be using, well, I mean, how do I want to ask this? Uh, the Cadillac 3, Makings of a Saturday, has a killer just big splash verb kind of thing on the snare. And I don't know how that one was created, but you seem to be comfortable create, making a big deal out of the snare if it needs it. Sometimes I think about like, you know, I think about having um, Bob Clearmountain on the, on the podcast, you know, he's somebody Definitely. to think of with big snare sounds. Even when I think about like in excess and those kind of things, like these bold snare statements on records that we, that, you know. Yeah. Or what was it? Uh, David Z. Fine Young Cannibals, She Drives Me Crazy. Right, like, that's that what I'm whole that's song what I'm of, yeah. is that snare drum. Yeah, yeah. And he'll tell you that they went, I, I'm pretty sure he went crazy on that, and it was obviously a sample, but then he reamped it through a snare drum with an oratone speaker on the bottom or some, like, you should call him and find out about that. But that thing's, that's legendary. It's the whole song. Exactly. And so, so what are some fun ways that you create wild snare stuff like that? Is it, um, how often it, is it a actual room is it more often sort of a sample of something that's that's added to a snare that gives us that kind of wild thing is it is it having just the right yamaha rx unit <laughs> in the rack that does that it's uh so it depends on what you get handed right um and i don't remember what was on that song i always have kick and snare samples available in fact it's not uncommon i mean pretty much every song that i open in the quote unquote template, there's a folder that is sampled snares and there's eight to 10 tracks of samples. And right? what, what do you find a particular plugin really helpful for playing back those samples? I use the SPL drum exchanger. Okay, great. Um, because it's, uh, I just like the way it works. It lets me physically dial in polarity and, and timing. Um, I, it gives me a transient designer for the trigger and a transient designer for the sample. Um, you know, nice. there's a couple of things I would improve on it, but, uh, um, especially where they save samples and how they save samples. But that one's been the most flexible to me. I'm sure there's like a ton of great ones. Um, but that's, we put a trigger spike, um, on every song and then I have a ton of snare samples just sitting there. And what I'll do is I'll pull up the drums and get the drums going and then I'll run through, samples and like maybe on that track it needed something that was just kind of clangy and brash and ringy and then I'll throw that through a reverb and just bring that up under and you get that kang on the snare drum I don't know I, you know it 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 really just depends on the song and most of the time if you turn the samples off it still sounds like a drum kit there's just a little character missing so I use it to fill in things that are impossible to fill in with EQ Right, it's not the forefront of the drum sound. Unless the, there's a unless there was a really rough color. problem, right? You know, um, or you want to change something. I just did a I just did a Carrie Underwood tune that was kind of like this throwback, um, vintagey sounding thing, and I deliberately went and found a like a Simmons 
like that kind of snare drum and put it in there and cranked it up. And then the, uh, the producer was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like that's a little crazy. But when then we found a balance between it where it actually worked for that yeah, song. Yeah. But most of the time, no, they're just slight augmentations. I had a band called the Proto Man who came into my studio years ago when I first built it. And they bought a Simmons drum kit and brought it into the oh, studio awesome. and needed eight DIs or whatever so that they could plug it in and record their that's record great. with it. I was like, hell yeah. All right, so um, in the interest of ending on close to on time, um, we'll ask the same question we've asked you before. Mm. We can take the Wayback Studio Machine, go back in time, you find young Reed, um, and you say, listen, dude, I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice do you want to go back and give yourself today? Oh, man. This um, time. You know, I, 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 it would be funny to go back and see what I, how I answered be, that question. It's, in it's the, just perfectly okay if it's the opposite in of the past. From last time. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think it would be two things. Um, it would be do what you love, right? And it would be um, I never, I never fail. I either win or I learn. Yeah. That was, that's the, I mean, that's Nelson Mandela, right? I'm Why do you think that. I have you on the podcast so many times? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. Because I'm failing constantly when I'm no, learning. For me. <laughs> We're all still trying to figure it out. And that's, you know. And, and uh, a friend of mine says this uh, all the time, and it's totally true. Like, we're here for a good time, not a long time. So have fun, right? Like, good point. Don't take yourself too seriously. It's music. This No one's going to die if the snare, other than you, if the snare doesn't sound great. But, you know, like, um, you know, have fun. Make it feel great. Yeah. One day we will die, and so you might as well have had a lot of fun making music Absolutely. when you had a chance to. Yep. Um, let the rock stars know where they can find you. Where should they go? What if they're ready to mix their next hit record or produce and or PEM their next right, hit record? Right, or PEM it. Um, you know, I mean, I'm I am generally Googleable. Um, you can go to robotlemon.com and you'll find a website that I haven't updated in a million years um, with a picture. When that you get I, it right the first time, it's perfect. With a picture that I hate, but you know, like whatever. Um, I'm available on the gram. I am I am not on Facebook. Um, so you're not going to find me there, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm generally findable. Right on. Oh, uh, just the last question. Um, yeah. cool glasses, man. Does the world really look like gold to you? It, it looks, uh, it looks slightly more gold, I think, than, than usual. And I, I, I enjoy that. Uh, I enjoy that vibe. So Rockstars, he's uh, always got cool, like black frame glasses with yellow goldish looking lenses that make me just make me want to go skiing. I, I think I have a pair of goggles <laughs> in the front. That it's not that extreme. It. it it started with uh it started with getting rid of headaches. Um, oh really? Yeah, with oh, like blue like blocker or block whatever. Blocking the screen. And then stuff. I got so used to them that it felt weird to not have color because yeah. I wore them so many yeah. hours in the day. So yeah. now they're just a mainstay. Yeah, well, that's all another discussion. But I've definitely. I mean, I'm wearing reading glasses right now, and that's sort of what I have on all the time. But um definitely think about how my head feels after a day of being in front of the computer and how related it is to looking at the computer totally. versus other things. So we'll talk about that next time. All right. Dude, can't, thanks for coming wait. and hang with us. Rockstars, thank you for listening. Um, Reed slash F, a.k.a. Shippen, Mr. Mm -hmm. Shippen. Thanks for having you me. You rock, dude. Thanks I appreciate for it. Us. Later. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rock stars now go make great music recording studio rock stars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who help make this episode possible lewitt adam audio native instruments isotope spectra 1964 and owc 
And remember, at isotope.com and nativeinstruments.com, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plugin purchase. If you enjoyed recording Studio Rockstars, please check out our sponsors using the links in our show notes, because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Streming, Liz Hulitskaya, and Roberto Oxman de Aragao for additional podcasts and video help. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.